Hello, everybody. Sorry for the uh, second delay there. For some reason, the streaming would not connect. But uh, yeah, we are good now. Looks like the uh, looks like the delay is pretty good. So that's that's good. That's good. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I. Yeah, I, let me see. I'm about to wait about one more minute just in case anyone else is going to show up. But yeah, no, it's uh, you know, we're gonna get we're gonna talk about uh, game analytics and systems and hopefully save you all a bunch of time because uh, the stuff I learned today I collected over a uh, a fairly long period of just trying new things, listening to the best people I could find, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully that 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 slightly longer journey well. We can give you a more efficient one. Uh, this is going to attempt to be like four books, uh, uh, two years of college as in a, as a game design major, and uh, two internships, and I guess a hundred games worth of experience rolled into one. So hopefully we uh, we get that in. But yeah, with uh, without further ado, uh, the Midas method. Good games take time. Great games take testing. Oh uh, yeah, so this is a pretty standard presentation. Uh, part one, demystifying success, figuring like uh, making sure that people understand where their games are going wrong so that they can actually take steps to fixing them. Uh, converting the rather number, anal like analytics, when you think of analytics, you think of math. But I don't know about you, most of the games that I play don't look like a bunch of math equations. So we gotta make that bridge. And then part three is, uh, Taking all that to uh, a visual place which is more comfortable to work with. And then finally, of course, the Midas method. Uh, and then we're going to end with Q&A. So yeah, who am I? What makes me qualified? Uh, don't worry, I'll keep this quick. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, me. Uh, and I've created over 100 games, as I mentioned. Uh, don't do this. <laughs> Most of those games that you're looking at right now are bad. And that's the thing, but I made them quickly. I made them quickly. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to make them before I, I grew up because uh, like that's the thing. Most of these games, I made like 90 of them before I turned 18. And the, and the, the follow, the, like the, everything following has taken like 10 times as long because now you've got to try to make quality. But hey, my most successful game took seven months, so I think the strategy worked out. Uh, yeah, so I was an internship. Uh, I went to two of them. Uh, yeah, it was it was fun. Yeah, I learned a lot. Uh, I after in fact after one of my internships, I was so like realizing like, oh I have so much left to learn. I actually went to a uh, uh, Indiana University, a uh, game design college, and yeah, it was uh, it was great. Like the, uh, I met a lot of awesome people there, and I learned a lot. I even took a game analytics course, so you're going to be getting uh, sort of an overview on that kind of stuff. And oh. Yep, and also a lot of books. Really, if you ha if I have to recommend any of them, uh, which I'm going to, I mean, they're not, I don't have to recommend them. Uh, the best books on here: uh, Advanced Game Design by Mike Sellers, um, Give Game Feel a Read, uh, and yeah, I guess uh, also Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. It's not game design, but I think it's an important book to read in terms of like understanding your players. Yeah, and so. <laughs> Why did I make this? Yeah, I, it's not like I have too too much time. Why did I take time to make this? Um, and it's because every time I'm on the uh, dev forum, I feel like I'm seeing, uh, oh, this isn't a new trend, but I feel like I, I see a lot of people asking, why is my game not doing well? Or why, uh, or, or is it, in this one I saw specifically uh, yesterday saying, is it worth making quality games on Roblox? And that just hit me like, most of the people in the thread were saying like, uh, "No, no, no! Don't make, don't make game quality games on Roblox. That'll all backfire." And that's fascinating to me, because, like, a lot of people who said no here went on to say, "No, you shouldn't make it for money, you, but you should make it because you want to, and because uh, game creation is something more than money." And yeah, it is, but, like. Money, uh, profit, in my opinion, is very clearly, uh, unless you make an active decision not to monetize your game, which, I mean, hey, go for that. 
Uh, money, like if someone's spending money in your game, <laughs> Mouse just said hello. Um, it's like, it's because they like it. It's because they engaged with it. If someone comes and visits your game every day, it's because they love your game. And make and uh, so making a quality game is uh, like theoretically it should be worth it because people want to support things that are worth it. And so, how do we get here? <laughs> and I say this with love. <laughs> Developers found out audiences. Because you're talking to someone who, the first internship went great. Second Robux internship. It's a game called Mortal Metal. I spent every bit of savings I had and then some. Yeah, I didn't crawl out of that financial hole for a while. And I spent it all trying to make this amazing game. And it flopped. Well, there was, I think, to some extent, I did. Like, I needed a few weeks just to process it. Like, figure out what went wrong and why it didn't work out. And, yeah, it's just, <laughs> hey, what, I, yeah, the, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm sorry. I was like, I can't just see the chat and, like, y'all are having, like, uh, a lot of interesting stuff to say. Like, uh, now I want to, I, I want to know what, uh, what book Wesley has. That, because there are some, oh, there's some awesome books. I have, like, I can, like, put them. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, I, there are some, I can do an entire talk just on amazing books uh, to read as a game developer. But, no, I'll get to, <laughs> sorry, distracted. But, yeah, no. Your games fail. It's going to happen. But that is because developers aren't perfect. It isn't because the audience just can't handle a quality game. And so if the problem's with me, which I think is a, like, that's the thing, like, you're, there are, like, uh, you can't really shield yourself from your own flaws when you make a game. You are putting yourself out there. And when someone says they don't like it, it hurts. And so I can understand why most developers don't necessarily test their games too much. But if you also want it to succeed, if you want it to be a game which other people enjoy, you have to have to take some extra steps. And so, yeah, that's pretty much what I think happens. You start a new game, release a game, game fails. And so when it fails, developers have to then ask themselves the question I ask myself, what went wrong? And from there, uh, the uh, the book of lenses. Oh, that one's great. Oh, uh, that one. Uh, I actually have a card that version of that one. Yeah, the uh, definitely recommend it. Yeah, the. So yeah, uh, I need to like, close the chat. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so yeah, it's you have like two routes, and if you can't figure out what went wrong with your game, well, this this option right here doesn't exist. Like, cause for if you can't find a single flaw in your game, it's because uh, how did how could it fail? It's because of the audience. But what I believe is likely the case in almost every situation, it's not that your game is flawless. It's that the ways that a game is measured by your players is different from the way you measure it. And because of that, yeah, we have a uh, yeah, we, we kind of have this group of people who don't think quality games are worth it. And I want to I wanna show them that, that it can be. Because you can have a game which you love, which your audience loves too. The, the, the bridge is very narrow. It can be the difference between a tutorial. It can be a difference between uh, polishing this one, this one bit of mechanic or removing a little bit of lag. That can make all the difference. And so, yeah, let's make, a, let's make the games market better for everyone. And make better games. Ones that reward the developers for all the all the tens, if not hundreds of hours they put into their projects. And one that doesn't waste players' time with a game that's unpolished and really not ready to play. So yeah. Anyway. Forgetting all these transitions I added in. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So yeah. What's happening here? That's, that's, the, that's the key thing. Um, and from there, we go to part one. Demystifying game success. The three pillars of success. Yes, experience, business, and marketing. Uh, this isn't this isn't too much of a hot take. I think most people would agree. Oh wait, yeah, you, there's a business side and a game side to things. Who who knew? Who who would have thought? 
Um, and then, of course, marketing. Well, in AAA games, marketing takes up most of the budget. Yeah, it, it's uh, so you can kind of see these pillars aren't exactly anything new. Oh, no. I left the pillars in the car, and they melted. What do what we even construct these out of? Ha! That was a, that was a little prank. Yeah, no. This was a transition. I don't even have a car. Yeah, so you can see we kind of have a little bit of a system here, a little bit of a model. And from there, we can actually get some meaning out of this complicated world that is the game developer industry. The, uh, and not necessarily the game industry, because that's... I'm talking about the industry of indie developers. So uh, this is very specific to Roblox in some ways, but also you can see trends in wider industry areas. I just haven't... I've ever, I haven't worked in AAA. I've worked as an indie dev. That's what we're talking about. Go to some AAA devs talk if you want otherwise. Um, yeah, so let's take a closer look at this. Um, my hope with this is to map out literally every area that you need to figure out in order for your game to succeed. That if you can establish success... Oh, you hear a lot of typing? Huh, yeah. I have uh, wonder where that could be coming from. Ah, it's okay. Uh, keyboards are very loud things, and I currently share an office with someone. So. Yeah, yeah. She's a very fast typer, though, so I'm proud of her. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no. <laughs> You're saying, oh, yes, it's, it's a free model, indeed. Yeah, uh, and I tell you, free models can be great. I'll stand, I, I will die on that. Like it's, free models can be amazing. And uh, you just got to integrate them right. You can't just lazily plop them down and be like, yeah, it's there. It's a car. Got to make sure everything looks the same. But yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, so from there we have all, so we're going to go through this a little with a little bit more of a fine tooth comb because I think this is very important because if your game is underperforming, it's on here. That's why I made this because I was tired of having Games, my my uh, my dreams, my 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 dream to be a billionaire. I'm tired of having that subverted by simple things like not knowing everything. So yeah, from there, let's start the marketing system. It's easy, and uh, actually, if I haven't already, let's go through. Let's talk about what these different uh, labels mean. Um, so red and green. Uh, red refers to inverse uh, inverse relationships, where if one goes up, the other one goes down. And green refers to direct relationships, where if something goes up, it also goes up. An example of an inverse relationship would be um, as the temperature increases past a certain point, your desire to be outside decreases. And a direct relationship would be uh, as the amount you earn increases, the amount you spend typically increases. So yeah, that's basic correlation stuff for you. Um, and the uh, colors of the various nodes refer to uh, configurable, meaning this will vary based on your own specific situation. Uh, and you can, to a large extent, control it. Uh, however, the uh, yellow, that refers to solvable. And when I say solvable, I mean like, if you have the variables, you will have a, def a, a definite answer. Like, you will have the true answer in whatever mathematical like, reality that is. If you, if you have all the information you need, you will know the exact answer. It's, uh, some of them can be fairly insightful, but some of them are also kind of like average revenue per user. If you have the amount of revenue and the amount of users, you can get average revenue per user. Like it's, it's that kind of stuff. Um, but basically, if you see yellow, that's easy. That's reality. That is not going to be something that will cause you too much trouble. I mean, you might fight to change the result of it, but yeah, it, it'll be something you can understand pretty easily. Uh, the sort of toothpaste colored ones, uh, those are predictable. They are stuff like the weather, where you have uh, something that you know follows trends, and you can sort of see a little bit farther into the future and get a basic idea, but at the end of the day, it is a prediction. You only can do it with so much certainty. And reality may come to pass and be a little bit different. Um, yeah, so, but there are like, ways you can predict it. There are models to use for those. And then finally, trackable. Trackable, I hate these. 
because trackable is just when a system is so complex, so difficult for you to comprehend, uh, that you kind of have to just narrow it down into a single set of measurements. For example, click to play rate. Why would somebody, um, why would somebody go and click your, your advertisement more often than less often? And uh, yeah, we'll be actually talking about aver we're talking about uh, the best ways to advertise in just the next few slides, actually. So uh, yeah, uh, hold out for that. The uh, but no, like, why does someone choose to uh, why does someone choose to click your ad? They might think it looks cool. That's that's probably it, right? They might think it looks cool. It might stand out to them. There's I do not know how to make that into a number. If there was an equation for coolness, I certainly would not be allowed near it. Like it, it is not. This is not an area which I'm qualified in. I may have a degree in game art, a minor in that, but like, I don't know how. I took like one art class. Um, anyway, anyway, anyone, anyone who's seen the look at my maps knows that I did not qualify for that. Um, yeah, so let's check out, let's actually go through this model. Um, so this one's pretty basic, Robux, Robux per impression. It's how much you spend times the rate. And the rate itself for how many impressions you get for your spending that, uh, that, uh, that varies based on, uh, I've noticed, on, from what I can tell, it's the amount of users currently on the platform. If you have a, uh, if you have a lot of users on the platform, uh, it seems to get more expensive. Uh, and if you have uh, a, uh, so, so the weekends are arguably the most expensive time, but also certain, uh, certain holidays, uh, probably seasonal to some extent. But yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's simple. It's multiplication. Uh, like, here's the thing. Uh, spoiler alert, but I'm actually going to, I'll have a tool for y'all which will do most of this for you. You won't have to, you don't have to figure out most of this stuff. I'm just explaining it to you because, like, you know, teach a man to fish and all that. Um, but when will we teach a fish to man? Uh, anyway, back on topic. Uh, the, just coming to terms with the stuff I say live. Yeah, so the rate, that'll vary. And sponsorships, sponsorships are weird. They're weird. I, I, they were a black box, and I don't really know what to tell you about them, other than the fact that I don't think they save you money. I think that they're a lot more expensive, because they'll say, hey, uh, people who saw this sponsorship went on and clicked yours a bit later. And I don't, I, that, that doesn't count. I don't like that. It, that's not enough information, because at the very least with advertisements, you just know who clicked. Like, it does, it's not about who saw it later and then had a change of heart. Like, no, it's who clicked the ad. And you can work with that. But how, saying that someone saw it and then came, noticed it later, they might not have even seen it. It just appeared on their page and they didn't notice it. Your ad could be horrible. And they just happened to find it at some, at some later point. Like, that, that, that's not helpful to me. So instead, advertise, like, don't, don't, I ignore that number. Because also the same logic would work to uh, the same logic would work in the sense of an advertisement where someone might see your advertisement and then play it later. Like, so you're getting that same boost on both sides, theoretically. Ooh, just bumped that. Uh, and yeah, so when you look at it through that lens, advertisements are way better. Uh, if you don't actively need the things like uh, platform targeting or certain targeting certain demographics. Um, I, I've used the age demographic one a few times just because I know that one thing which well, can very much influence your, uh, your, your uh, preferences for games is uh, how, like, how difficult it is. And I've noticed that older players tend to enjoy, uh, handle diff more difficult games a bit better. Um, and I'm seeing in the chat, uh, how do I motivate myself to make quality games, even if most of them fail? Well, I guess two things. The first one is, ideally by the end of this, most of your games won't fail. Like, can you imagine if a triple A game, if every game they released failed? No, those ones that they that that industry exists on hitting uh, game after game out of the park. So you can make games can uh, successful, and in fact, the reasons games fail at all in the industry are very rarely um, when at a professional level because they aren't fun. It's because they didn't get enough time in testing. It's because they didn't get enough time to work on it. So you'll come to find that many of your games from now on, hopefully. When they fail, it's not because I don't know how to fix this. It's I know the fix for this, and I can't afford it. Like, it either takes too long, it's too difficult, I could start a new project and do have better odds. That's the decision you need to make. 
So, no, you, your games won't fail in the way that they usually do after this. Uh, in terms of motivation, I mean, if you know the path and if you know what you need to do, um, ideally, I, in my experience, just I, get, I lose motivation when I'm stuck, when I can't solve a problem. And this entire presentation is going to be about solving those problems, which are so difficult. And so, yeah, uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll also get the benefit of being able to stay motivated a bit better. Because when a problem is difficult, you will, well, you'll have a solution. You can solve your problems. You can, uh, at least you can solve the problem of knowing what your problems are. Because right now, a lot of us are, uh, pre-analytics would be, uh, it's like taking a test and you can't even read the question. So yeah, let's, uh, hopefully with this you'll be able to focus more on finding out those great answers. And there are some great answers. Uh, check some of the books I referenced earlier. Anyway, CTR, this one's simple. Uh, actually, no, it's not even supposed to be uh, CTR. I don't know why I put CTR there. But anyway, daily impressions. Uh, this one's easy how much you spent times the impression rate. In fact, if you look at this equation, it's, we kind of just did that backwards. Um, and uh, yeah. So from there, we get click-through rate. Click-through rate is equal to itself because like, that's, some, that, that's, that's, a measure, that's a measuring area. You have to measure for that. I can't, I can't give you an equation for what your click-through rate is going to be. If someone, if someone figures it out, like, by all means, I, I think, uh, like, OK, here's the thing. The blue, anything that says blue, it can be solved. You just need like a neural network. <laughs> like that's that's the reality. You you need a neural network, and then you can turn turn all of those into the toothpaste color. Um, yeah. So indie games taking advantage of analytics, but don't manage to get the same hundred percent success rate as AAA games. Uh, yeah. So I think one thing to consider for indie devs is that their runways are a lot shorter most of the time. Um, it's 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 a it's it's a double whammy because all the people in AAA industry, like they are they are not only the best of the best, they are the best of the best working with the best of the best. If you have a flaw in your approach to games, if you have something that you can't see, a, a, an error which you always miss, the person next to you won't miss it. Like like when you're working on a team of hyper qualified people, there will be less mistakes made. There will be more people in the room to stop you from making a bad decision. And an indie dev working alone with uh, a bunch of GDC videos, like they're going to be limited. And so, in terms of uh, limited resources, like you're limited in both the ideas you have access to, the ideas that will be recommended to you by a, by a colleague, because you don't have those colleagues. You're more or less working alone with some people you'll see every few years at RDC. Um, yeah, and in terms of uh, taking, but. That does not necessarily mean it's hopeless. It just means it's more difficult. But it's also more rewarding. Like, if you make the next Minecraft, you're a billionaire. That's the reality. No one in a AAA industry who's actually coding is going to be a billionaire. That's not going to happen. Uh, they might get paid handsomely, but their games would have made them billionaires if they had been the one to actually fully make it. And so, yeah, that's the, that's the sacrifice you make. Um, yeah, but I mean, hopefully by the end of this, you'll see that the 100% success rate is never going to be about why is my game failing. It's going to be my game is failing because of these reasons, and I don't know how to fix them. And that deserves another talk of how to fix those. But for now, let's just continue to through with the uh, click-through rate. Yeah, and uh, speaking uh, also, uh, let's see. So game market... Uh, we'll, t we'll actually be talking a little bit more about marketing in a second, but uh, yeah, standing out, honestly, who here has ever played a simulator game that felt like every other simulator game and then checked and it's like earning the person millions of dollars? I'm not really convinced standing out matters. Like, there are so many games that exist in the same space. I don't think it's about standing out. I think it's about getting players into your game and then keeping them because you've made a great game. And we'll be looking at through this later. There's no part of this equation that, said, that takes into account another competitor because it's not about them. It's not about the market. It's not about the audience. It's about you. It's about you making your game. And because of that, 
Well, yeah, the, uh, let's talk about all that stuff. Um, yeah, and you can scale up your team if you're making a profit, but that always that is not always the case. I personally only make enough to support me, and even then, that, that can be tough some months. Um, didn't help that I moved to the most expensive city on the planet. Not planet, country. I'm being dramatic. Okay. Anyway, so click-through rate. Uh, yeah, uh, CTR is higher for better ads. I mean, uh, a graphic artist could give you much better talk on how to make good ads. But uh, for what I can tell, the only other information I can really give you is skyscraper ads tend to have higher CTR. Um, it's not always the case. It, I mean, if it's between the two of these, a, a good banner ad will do better than a bad skyscraper ad. But yeah, uh, I think skyscraper ads tend to be better in my experience. Uh, daily clicks, that's CTR times daily impression. This is all very simple, you. But basically, this is the this is the marketing. This is the advertising wing. This is this is where you buy new players because from there, once you have your clicks, this is uh, the retention loop. This is where things get really interesting because they have uh, because if you look here, you'll notice that all these clicks, well, they transform into these. Uh, daily purchased users. So you have it, you go all over here, you start, you, you make an ad. The ad has these features, which uh, based on how much you spend, you get a certain amount of impressions, which gives you a certain amount of clicks, which you can solve for, and then from that certain number of clicks, you get the daily purchased users, which is new people going into your game. And yeah, no, uh, I, I, I think, oh, while I, I, I do not regret answering any questions so far, I do think looking at the time, I will need to keep going. I, I talk fast as is, and I'm telling you guys, we're only like a fifth of the way through. Like, <laughs> yeah, the a lot of lot of information. Um, hopefully, I don't just see the numbers drop. Like, oh no, what is he going to do to us? Like, uh, but yeah. So, daily purchased users, they are, they are the new players into your game. They are the reason the market doesn't matter. They are the reason that you don't have to worry about competitors because your game is typically going to be free to play. The only thing that it will cost them is time. And all you need to get them in is keep them interested. It's not about unique selling points. It's about selling points. It's about showing them something cool. Like, who here has seen a movie and saw this awesome-looking explosion at the end or, like, this awesome-looking fight and thought, oh, I've seen movies with fights before. I don't need to see this. Apologies for the sirens. This is, uh... My apartment doesn't have air conditioning, so I have to prop the AC unit in the window. And uh, I guess, yeah, so it's just, that's just life in New York, if you can call it life. But yeah, um, I'm just, just saying it wrong. What? I don't know what you said. Oh, no, they can. Troubleshooting streams live is always fun. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, they thank you, New York, for, con for this contribution. Um, but yeah, so sorry. Back on topic, everybody. Um, let's see. Best of luck to whoever that emergency siren was going towards. The daily purchase users. Those are your users. Those are the people that you actively uh, are gaining. Like, it's not about it's not about the other games. It's about who are you getting into your game. Now, by all means, if your game is the neck is like super unique and visibly interesting, then like that'll help. Like that'll make stuff easier. Like you can, like you don't have to necessarily make the most boring game ever. Whatever helps you sell the game helps. But it, it can also be boring. It that, like it's not like that's the thing. Int intrigue is not a factor here. There's the click through rate, but you can solve that a hundred different ways. Like, you remember those garbage YouTube videos? Like, like that, uh, like, or just any children's TV show. There are the ones which are bad, but still are on air. And then there are the great ones, which stick around for a long time. I encourage you to make, essentially, a great TV show. But it is one aimed at kids, so it's not, they're not going to be too picky. But 
you have to do some core things right. And these are those core things. And yeah, I think that uh, those things can be solved for, like the click-through rate. Uh, but yeah, daily purchased users, that goes into your daily active users, which goes into your concurrent players, which goes back into the click-to-play rate. And that's what's interesting. Let, let me see. So uh, for one, the click-to-play rate is very interesting uh, because it, this, this is a loop. You guys have probably noticed at this point, right? This is a loop. You have the daily purchased users, the people you purchased for your game. They are added to your daily active users. Those daily active users, that increases your concurrent players. And then, because there are more people playing the game, the next person who clicks the ad and is looking at your game and considering joining, those see people are playing it and are more likely to join. Yeah. That's amazing. Like, that's, that, like, I feel like I, I don't appreciate how cool that is. Because you have a basically a runaway success cycle where the more people you get into your game at once, the easier it is to get more people. It's great. Um, yeah, and yeah, so the like dislike ratio will also help with that, of course. So once again, don't make your game garbage. They're they're children, they're not idiots. They 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 know what quality is. They can have a good time in a game that isn't polished, but it has to be fun. And so we can't necessarily excuse quality. We have to make, to make sure that's still at the forefront. But yeah, like-dislike ratio, click-to-play rate. These are fairly standard terms. You know them. You know how to avoid them most of the time. Uh, don't, have, don't have a laggy game. Make sure that your game has good onboarding. Uh, don't overly monetize it. That'll be annoying. Uh, don't rely too much on uh, uh, free models. Like, you can use free models, but you've got to integrate them. You can't just plop it down. It has to look like a cohesive game experience. Because then they'll know and they'll be like, oh, this game's free models. Ugh, I don't like that. Ugh, this, this dev's lazy. This dev isn't lazy. This dev has a budget. Ugh. I swear, it's like game development for me is like cycling between like, I don't know, Willy Wonka and like, get off my lawn. Um, but yeah, no. Oh, I keep bumping this thing. Okay. Yeah, the... So daily purchased users, that your daily active users is your returning users plus your discovery users uh, plus your purchased users from before. So uh, returning users, we'll get to more of that later, but that's users who visited before and come back. Discovery users are people who have just stumbled upon your game through some magic. And this is where Roblox is a bit behind on things because most, if not all other platforms, will help you figure out where your discovery users are coming from. Roblox is not one of them. I don't know if a person found my game because they saw an influencer play it. I don't know if they found my game because it was recommended to them, the algorithm. I don't know if they found my game uh, because a friend recommended it, but they didn't join with that friend. You can track to see if they join specifically with a friend, but you can't really, you can't like know like was it recommended word of mouth. And in fairness, most platforms actually can't do that part, but you know. Uh, or even just that they searched your game and the, the tag related to it came up because Here's the thing what you don't realize. You know those games which have a bunch of tags in the description to try to game that system? That hurts their like to dislike ratio because someone will search for it thinking one thing and then they'll play it and they're like, oh, this isn't that. This is, this is lame. Thumbs down. Hurts, how, hurts their click to play rate. Like, that's the thing. This is all connected. And yeah, but so here's the thing. You can't tell who your discovery users are. Like, you don't, can't tell where they're coming from. But you know the reasons they usually show up. Make sure you have your bases covered. And if, you, and if your discovery users are low, uh, there are some things that can influence that. And we'll actually, re, uh, retention rates actually have a pretty high correlation with them. And we'll talk more about that later. But for now, just know your daily active users, it's these people. Um, and yeah, so concurrent players, this one's probably the only equation which might not be immediately uh, accessible. It's important, but it's not anything too crazy. You have the uh, you have the average visits per user, and by the way, these acronyms are not like real. Like you, you can't just say to someone like, "Hey, what's your game's ASL?" and they'll be like, "Yeah." Like no, these are abbreviations I'm using to uh, help, you know, convey stuff and keep the equation short. Yeah, so you have uh, average session length, sessions per day, and average daily visits per user, and with that, you can figure out how many concurrents you have at any. Uh, at any 
one moment, right? On average, the average concurrence. Uh, there is actually one modification you can make to it if you want to be even more accurate. Uh, one thing you may not realize is that almost 75% of uh, users on Roblox, at least when I last checked, uh, about 75% of them play between the hours of 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you want to figure out like what peak hours will look like in your game concurrent-wise, because if you're on a budget and you want to advertise your game with a full server, you can just only advertise it for those peak hours, like, or you only use the data from those peak hours where it is a full server. And to solve for that, all you have to do is uh, divide it by, uh, I believe, 75%. So just divide this entire thing by 75% as well. Uh, or by 18, I guess, at the bottom. Uh, yeah, so that's a modification you can make. Yeah, so but let's talk a little bit more about reinforcing and bouncing loops. Because I, I mentioned this earlier, but, the, but this loop right here is reinforcing. Now, reinforcing loops and bouncing loops, they make up the heart of game design. It's what they taught, uh, they taught me a ton about it at Indian University. Yeah, and uh, hey, they're all okay. Um, yeah, and... Uh, yeah, so keeping them in the game. Oh, yeah, so the Fire King, you mentioned keeping them in the game. Well, that's, that, you're going to love the, the, this presentation then because we're going to be getting like, very deep into that. We're going to figure out every single reason a player would leave you. Because once they're in your game, like, game over. Like, no, they, they, I'm not even kidding. The second you get a user into your game, the ball is fully in your court. There is nothing they can do to stop you at that point. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's... I think it's also worth mentioning, like, uh, if, you, if anyone here has uh, our track, if you look at the daily active users, um, you'll see that, like, uh, you can double check my ratio. It may have changed. I, I think I made it a few months ago. Um, but, yeah, the uh, international audiences, while certainly an, an audience with catering to, they aren't necessarily an audience which appears in enough of a uh, sim same moment for uh, peak hours. And if your game, I've met a few developers who focus almost entirely on non-English speaking audiences. And they do really well because of it. Because those, game, those audiences aren't always catered for. And so if you suspect your audience isn't in the United States, I, or uh, I guess any of the Americas, because they're in approximately the same time zone, yeah, like, make sure that you adjust for that. Like, that's the reason I didn't include in this equation, because it will vary. Yeah. And uh, so let's, uh, let's let, so this, this loop that I'm talking about, though, this a reinforcing loop, there are many examples of them in the world. Think of a black hole. I think a black hole is the one that I love the most because I love stars and space. And so a black hole, as a black hole gets bigger, it can now suck in more things. And because it can suck in more things, its gravity get like, uh, and because it, it, it sucks in more things, it now has a larger mass, which increases it how much uh, uh, the gravitational pull. And then that brings in more things. And like, so you get this runaway effect or even like a, a chain reaction, like, uh, like a fusion or an atomic bomb, really. Like, that is an example of a runaway uh, reaction, a reinforcing loop with no real uh, end in sight. Uh, well, actually, in a bomb, there is an end in sight, thank goodness. But, you know, I should stop using science references. That, like, <laughs> I was the only one who, who enjoyed that class. Uh, no, but balancing is the opposite. If, uh, if reinforcing is a ball speeding up as it rolls down a hill, balancing is it reaching a valley. A balanced... Uh, a, a balanced equation, uh, I'm sorry, a balanced system is one that is at rest. It is at, e it, it, it returns to equilibrium. Whereas a reinforcing one, it spirals out, uh, out of equilibrium very quickly. It's hard to keep in that state. And because of these two, na the nature of these two things, a system is, it's, is the combination of them. Because you have reinforcing forces that promote change, but then balancing forces to make sure that change does not become untenable. And yeah, that's the core. That's the core uh, of of like loop game design theory. Yeah, so it's I don't think it's too difficult. But the things like Lego bricks, Lego bricks themselves are pretty easy to understand. But then you'll watch like some master builder make like the Eiffel Tower half to scale or something. You'll be like, oh, maybe I'm not good at Legos. Maybe that's just me. Uh, yeah. The anyway. So retention loop. This is an example I was telling you about earlier. Daily active users increases concurrent players, which increases the click-to-play rate, which increases how many daily purchased users you get, when, and that just loops infinitely. Like just like that. That it, it, if there weren't for balancing forces, this would continue until every human on Earth was playing your game. 
That like it sounds stupid, but like if there weren't balancing forces, that is how it would go. The entire planet would be playing your game, just like uh, like until like uh, like so. I mean, assuming you could get a, get them all to like see see the advertisement, which I guess that would that would involve a few things, but you know, that is the kind of absurdity we're dealing with. But there are balancing forces, and we'll get to them in a bit. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, it can be. A, it's hard to tell exactly how a player who doesn't click, if later on they change their mind, if that's something that you can control or not. That's up for debate, I guess. But in general, yeah, the the, the this this loop's a very good place to be, and you want to make sure. And be, and it has some cool implications later. So yeah, let's take a step back, and we're gonna look at the marketing system. Uh, in its entirety, you have the spending, and so you have down here you have a uh, you have marketing spending going to daily impressions, and you have a daily advertising rate, a campaign duration, um, and obviously you actually we see a I won't spoil that actually we'll we'll go we'll go on to the next thing. Um, so this is the business system. You'll notice it has some overlap, such as the money area. What a surprise! But yeah, the business system. This one's also pretty easy. In fact, it's so easy to the point. Where I have somewhat automated it, and I will be showing you guys that too in a bit. And yeah, so it's it's business. Um, yeah, it, I'm sorry. This one's it, it, it. This one very like this side of it is boring to me, but this side of it's some really exciting stuff. And let, let's focus on that. All right. So this is called the engagement engine because if you uh, you'll notice that the majority of the key performance indicators are actually in this area. And honestly, they, I should probably have included the uh, revenue, which is right here. But this engine right here, this is how a game succeeds. And that is the core of the entire process. And so from there, we can, uh, yeah, we can take a deeper look at that. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll be posting, uh, I'll be posting all this entire slideshow uh, at the, uh, at the, after the game, uh, sorry, after the stream finishes rendering and uploads as a full video. I'll even include, like, little bookmarks in case you guys want specific references but yeah so uh, you have R standing for reinforcing loops and there are two there's the one we just talked about and then there's this other one um, let's see the for example so with the other one you have uh, it goes concurrent players uh, let's see yeah so concurrent players in the same way which they improve a uh, the click to play rate for new players they get old players to come back. If someone sees your game, if someone played your game, liked it, and comes back and no one's in the game, and it's like a game which involves other people or at least is more fun with other people, then yeah, that's going to hurt your retention rate. That's why so many people who advertise just one day in a row have horrible retention rates because they, like, the, people who, the people who play their game who might want to come back don't have any reason to. Like, they, they, they realize it won't be as fun, and so they don't come back. And uh, that has some interesting implications, which we'll get to later. But yeah, that's that's a very big uh, influence, and you need to keep that heavily in mind. Uh, and from there, you have retention rates, of course, influencing your daily returning users, which then influences the average daily visits per user, as well as the daily active users more broadly, such as through discovery players. And you'll you're, some of you may be wondering why discovery players are linked to daily return or uh, daily returning users, and we'll get to that. But for now, just know. This is how things flow. That rhymed. Um, and because of that, concurrent players gets boosted by all this, which then boosts daily returning users. And then on top of that, concurrent players is also boosted by purchasing users. And so you can imagine, you can fathom how all of these things together create a very elegant system for people moving through your game and making your game rise up through the games page. And all of it is solvable in one way or another. You can measure the blue stuff. You can predict the toothpaste color stuff. Uh, is it, why don't you think of a better word for that color? Is it, is it, is it cyan? I don't know. No, that's kind of the other blue. Uh, anyway, daily returning users. And then, of course, you can solve literally for the yellow ones. And from there, we have the, uh, let's see, we have the, uh, the more, we can take a step back and look at the financial constraints. And the financial constraints, it's, we're not going to spend too much time on this because I don't think it's too interesting, but there is one core loop here. 
uh, a one 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 uh, balancing loop. And it's kind of why the, the balancing loop is why in like Kotaku articles, the business side is always the reason things go badly. By the way, I'm not saying that like people in the business side of games are bad. I'm saying they're the ones who have to deal with the harsh realities a lot more often. Like, <laughs> and because they often have, have to go into the bad guy role, but also genuinely sometimes do bad things to try to alleviate it. So anyway, that's the wider industry trend. Point is, uh, there are various uh, inverse relationships here, which means that those are considerations. In fact, the, the most difficult decisions you'll have to make are when a green line and a red line start from the same point. Because you have to know that's a game of optimization. And with some calculus, you can solve this stuff, or a simulation. If you don't want to do calculus, I don't blame you. Uh, yeah, you can solve for most of these most of the time, but still, it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, and yeah, so you got to figure out how much budget you spend on marketing. Like, you know how AAA games, they'll have like, a, like two thirds of the budget will go to marketing? That's where this happens, because they realize that the development budget takes away from the marketing budget. And the marketing budget is what makes all of this side of it possible. It's what flows all of this in here. Which, by the way, before most games, even the big ones, if they don't advertise it, they will not hit, they will not break even. Like you don't, like, like you don't break even on just your existing fan base alone. There are very few franchises which could even claim that. You, uh, with, I guess the alternative is keep the budget ridiculously small to hit that goal. But you know, that's another that's another issue. Uh, so yeah, as you as you advertise and increase how much, uh, basically, the more you advertise, the less profit you have, and the less profit you have, the less you can spend back on advertising. And so this kind of pushes you to a point of optimal um, advertising, which you can solve for. And I believe that is coming up. Uh, yeah, so if we go uh, to the next area, this is more, this is sort of viewing the entire thing as a whole. All of these different loops, um, per se. You have the, this massive, this massive, massive, massive um, uh, reinforcing loop right here, where daily active users increases your revenue, which increases your profit, which increases how much you can advertise a day, which increases your users, which increases your, pro like, it just, it goes, it, this is, that one's very important, and it is why large developers spend so much on marketing because it is what fuels uh, the. It's literally it, it, this is the gas. This is what provides the gasoline for this engine I was just talking about. Um, and for here, you have the uh, sort of retention loops that I was talking about, where concurrent players encourage returning users, which encourages more daily active users, and then finally. And what I believe is the most, it, it, this is what I, this, this optimization method I've been teasing about. Uh, the, that is the campaign duration. That is the, um, the actual, what's it called? Uh, that is how, sorry, I just zoned out. Anyway, campaign duration. That is how long your campaign is. It is if you advertise uh, X amount of days in a row. And when I say days in a row, that's very important. We'll get to that. But, um, it is how many days you've advertised in a row. And, obvious, and I would say that the longer a campaign is, the, uh, the, better, the better your daily returning users are. And I'm saying even if you, re if you have, uh, like that, that's the interesting part. I'm saying that the longer your campaign is, the better, even if they both have the same budget. I mean, if you blew all of your budget on one day versus spreading out over a longer period of time, I think that that actually works better. And so let's go into why. Um, and actually, before we get too deep into that, uh, that reminds me, I never actually explained the discovery section. Um, I think I mislabeled it. I was supposed to talk about that at some point. Um, but yeah, so the, the discovery stuff, right here, discovery players. There's a, nine, there's a 0 0.94 correlation between day one retention rates and discovery players, like new players who appeared without being advertised to. I, I have no idea why this is. I don't know if it's the Robux algorithm, because I don't know where these players are coming from. But it is shockingly high. Like this is across, so the sample size I used to get this finding was across uh, 
uh, last seven games I worked on, uh, which uh, had enough players go through it to get a uh, a a, a uh, respectable sample size. Uh, sorry, uh, a respectable uh, 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 what's it called uh, margin of error. And because of that, you kind of see how at around five, I really at the eleven percent. Uh, day one retention rate, or just about 1.5% day seven retention rate, like a switch flips, like something happens, and you go from, uh, you you go from, bare like this is logarithmic. Look at the bottom. It goes from like 900 uh, free users a, uh, a day to 4,000, like uh, actually six, uh, five thousand, uh, five thousand. Like it's a massive jump. And even if I had more data points, I still think it'd be pretty pretty startling how much it ramps up just because of how predictably, like how small changes below like 5%, that can mean seven players a day or that can mean 900. Like, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, no, it, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, no, as, as Rath points out, like it's a very natural idea to want to blow all your advertising budget early. And I used to do that, but we're let you, I hope hopefully the slide the slide after this one will be even more impressive then It'll be more helpful because all I want you to know from this one is discovery players like the majority of discovery players are influenced through retention and in fact I was only, I'm not as confident in saying that it, it doesn't involve any of these other variables but I did actually run a meta-analysis on the various uh, key performance indicators to see which one of them were influencing each other the most. And the rate and the retention rate was influencing things not only more than any other variables, but wasn't, like, uh, it's not even influenced by the variables uh, more than that. Like, there was, no there was no variable which could kind of be implied to be uh, as directly, like, like could, could take the crown as most important variable. Uh, the closest is average session duration, but even then, like, yeah, they're so tied together, it's hard to say what does or doesn't matter. But I'm telling you, retention rates, those are how you get players for free. And in fact, if, you do, if your retention is good enough, you won't even have to buy new users. Like, that's the thing. You can cut out the marketing side. You don't need to spend a, a ton on marketing after an initial release goes well. My most successful game, which has gotten over 180 million visits, has never run an ad. It has never run an ad. I released it to an audience who liked the previous game, which did run ads, and that initial audience had a high enough retention rate to get the game recommended to new users. Within the first day, it was on the front page. And I didn't spend a single dollar. That is the power of this discovery area, because you'll find that the discovery users, the users you get for free, are the only way that uh, you can have sort of this cash cow effect where a game is good for years. Because otherwise, you have to have a massive average revenue per user, one to the point where it's, it's absurd. Like, you have to either have a game that's designed with monetization from the forefront or just be really good at it. Because I, I cannot imagine uh, a game really succeeding long term on just shoveling in new users through advertisements. Like, you might find that you can benefit from a little bit of advertising, but the majority of your game is coming from discovery players. Okay? So, discovery users are very important. And discovery users are from really good retention rates. So, yeah. Let's talk about what a campaign actually looks like in action. This is, this is the tool I've been talking about. The Campaign Duration Solver. Um, it's this tool which I'll be linking... Uh, uh, with this presentation, uh, where basically it can simulate different uh, campaigns through the through all the logic I presented earlier, um, it this does that automatically. You include how much your cost per player is, your budget, how long you want the campaign to go, um, how much of your profit you'll be reinvesting. Uh, you'll you should also include uh, any discovery players you're currently getting because it doesn't solve for the new discovery users because that's a bit difficult to predict. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, like that's, yeah, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Rath, like this, people focus a lot on advertising because it gets that immediate result, but they don't know why it didn't stick. They don't know why people stopped coming back. 
And people stopped coming back because their retention rate wasn't good enough. So yeah, marketing loses its value very quickly, I'd say. That marketing is, is for when a game is being troubleshooted. Marketing is for when a game's in trouble. It's for when like the game, it's for when the retention rate uh, normalizes out to basically when, when, the, when things evaporate. When you don't have enough discovery users to fill a full server, you get sort of the spiral. And to get discovery users, you need to obviously get initial users because I believe that the actual, uh, there is, I don't think that whatever system does it, it's not, a, it's not technically a percent. It's, when I say day one retention is the key figure, I sh unless I've misspoke, I should be talking about players. Because that means, that doesn't mean, like you could technically get a 100% retention rate if you have one person leave and then come back and only have one person play. Like, that's a 100% retention rate. No, you need hundreds of people, if not thousands, to come back. Um, and because of that, advertising makes sense there. So, yeah, do not, do not use advertising on a crutch. Because here, people who are advertising constantly, the, the runway is going to run out eventually. At some point, people, that advertisement will stop working. They'll, they'll be burning so much money on ads. They'll be doing all this stuff. And if the game, and if they aren't trying to actively troubleshoot the retention rate, eventually the advertisement mechanism will fail. They won't be able to make a profit. Because here's the thing. In order, the cost per player on average for an, for an advertisement is around six to seven to sometimes uh, up to 10 Robux. How many games have an average revenue per user of 10 Robux? Because from, my, from what I've uh, been able to read, only the top 25. You can see that right here. Top 25 games have the best average revenue per user. And that best average revenue per user, the peak of the entire Roblox industry, has at best, like, if, if they were to put up a bad advertisement, at best, a top 25 game would not lose money. They would barely make any money at all. It's because it's they don't advertise. That that, that at least they, they shouldn't, from what I can tell. It there are very few instances. Um, I guess if well, in fairness, if you have a top twenty five game, and you have a good cost per player for advertising, like six, every time you spend a dollar on advertising, you get two dollars in in in, uh, in revenue. So in their case, it actually does make sense. But for everyone else, the top one hundred people, it does not make sense. The top two hundred fifty people, it does not make sense. And we'll look at 250. It does not make sense. You need to have really good revenue for advertising to ever make sense as a long-term business strategy. Uh, and so, no. The, uh, yeah, we, what you need is a good retention rate, which fuels that discovery process and gets you the players you need. Because a player that is discovered, that's zero, that's zero dollars. That's a cost per player of zero dollars. It, any dollar they spend is theoretically an infinite increase in like in terms of, like the ratio of how much of spending to like returns becomes infinite now in reality of course you spend time on a project and you might pay for the creation of a game but I mean still if people are playing your game for free if people are joining it for free that's great and you want to maximize that because the other method just can't and so yeah, no, uh, maximize your retention. And in fact, we can see uh, not only maximize your retention, but maxima maximize your duration. And that's because of this really interesting effect, uh, which makes sense when you think about it. It's fully logical. There isn't any like, like uh, magic happening here. This is a fully solvable, deterministic world that, that we're working with in terms of advertising, like in retention. If you have a retention rate, and this is... Because uh, if you have a retention rate of X, uh, uh, of X users, but that retention rate is influenced by how many concurrent players you have, then that means to increase the amount of returning users you get, you need to increase the amount of concurrence you get. But CJ, CJ, surely uses it having more, uh, more spending on the first day, that increases the concurrence. Yes, it does increase the concurrence on the first day. But then, if you spend, but then day two when you're not advertising, it drops like a rock. This graph shows different campaign durations across different times, different simulations, and you'll notice that day one they get uh, 400 concurrence, bam. Day two, 50. Then it just goes down for the based on the retention rate. Now, if you take that exact same budget, 
I think I used 100,000 in this example. If you take the exact same budget of 100,000 Robux, divide it across three days, this is what it looks like. You get not as high up, but you'll notice that the game is actually live for a lot longer. It's live for, uh, it's live for three days, it, and then the, the actual gradual slope, it, um, it's, like, you'll notice that that gradual slope is higher for the majority of the time. In fact, it's higher for, if I understand correctly, it is always going to be higher than day one. So you will always have more concurrence up until the point where, where you get, like, zero. And then day seven, seven days of campaigning with the same budget. Day one, you get, like, 80 players. Then, uh, then from there, you get, you, it keeps going up and up and up until you get 250. And then, uh, you, then you stop spending, and it starts going down a bit, and down a bit, and down a bit, and then starts going to that gradual decline. And then 14 days, same thing. Up, 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 down, 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 down. But look at the 14-day one. Look what this means. Imagine your game needs 30 players to be fun. Uh, like, there are many games. Which, that's, a, that's a full server. Uh, and so you need 30 players to be fun. That's here. And now, between these two strategies, where you could, instead of, cho you could choose to advertise for 14 days or advertise for one day, the same budget across 14 days will give you at least 17 to 18 days to improve your game. That's, that's, that's almost three weeks to focus on improving your game, to get better retention, to get better everything, to, to improve every key performance indicator. You have almost three weeks when you advertise over a longer period at smaller amounts. Whereas the person who advertises on day one, if they advertise at all, realize, oh no, the retention's horrible. Bam, they sink even lower than this. Because at best case scenario, if they had good retention, it would have lasted them. Like if they had not horrible retention, which by the way, like this, these graphs, show a world where you don't get any new discovery users. Like, this is what it would look like if no one ever joined your game for free. It's not reality, but I don't know how to solve for discovery users other than very vague predictions. And I'm not confident enough in those yet to integrate them into this, the tool. Because I think, I don't want the tool to become inaccurate. It just has to be accurate in its own context. And in this context, this game's in trouble. If they do not have a high enough retention rate, with, let's just assume that all these don't have a high enough retention rate. Because realistically, if you don't have a high enough retention rate to get discovery users, this is what it will look like for you. And they, all of a sudden, when they could have had three weeks, they now have closer to three days. That's horrible. That is a horrible trade-off. They will have to solve every problem holding back their game to the point of balancing out. They have to solve that in three days. Don't do this to yourself. Advertise for longer periods of time. Figure out exactly how much you need to advertise to fill a server or two. Two or three. If, your game, if you aren't confident in your game, if it's a new game, start small. Figure out if stuff's going well. And heck, if your game is doing so badly that no one's retain, being retained, like no one's coming back, well, yeah, you don't have to keep on advertising, and you get the rest of your money back. If you do that and advertise on one day, and you realize, oh, no, this game's bad, you, th you can't get a refund for that. So, yeah, no. Spread out your advertising over a long period. This is supported in both this, this model, this simulation, and it is supported in this overall uh, uh, model. Because you have the campaign duration, as that increases, more daily returning users, which increases people willing to come back. Uh, and then that, that you just, you, you basically, by increasing your campaign duration, you fuel this loop right here, which fuels this loop, which fuels this loop. Like, you fuel all three of your reinforcement loops with a longer campaign. That is why it's so good. That is why it is so amazing. Because you are literally hitting every single major area that you need to with a single move that costs you nothing and gives you only good things. I cannot stress this enough. But I can stress this enough in the sense that it'll get boring at some point. So let's move on to the next topic. But yeah, hope that made sense. <laughs> um, Yeah. The so this one is the one which will be most uh, most aware with. Like, uh, oh yeah, no, uh, premium payouts. Premium payouts are amazing. I usually just incorporate them into the average revenue per user. For one, it makes it look a little bit less shameful when the <laughs> average revenue per user is bad. But also, um, you know, it, it just makes the math easier. But no, premium premium payouts are actually a really big thing these days. So by all means, 
cater to your premium users. Make them happy that they're there. Because if you have a feature which is only available, like people have been slow to pick up on the premium exclusive features because they don't want to be like, oh, but if they buy something, if they buy premium, that doesn't go to me. I'd rather just keep selling them stuff in my game. But what you don't get is premium exclusive features. A person who knows that if they, because of their premium status, that they get something that makes them cooler than the other ones. All right, no, uh, yeah, no, th thank you for stopping by, man. Yeah, no, time, time zones, it's, it's rough. Uh, but yeah, no, like, but with premium users, if they realize that when they're in this game, they are the coolest person in the room because of this in-game exclusive item or something, they are much more likely to return. Like, just time and time again, if you implement premium-specific features in your game, it rewards them and brings them back. And because of that, because of them just being in your game earns you money, it is worthwhile. And frankly, because even if they didn't earn any money, like you'd want them to come back. Like it's if premium users did not give me a single dollar, I would still recommend on having some premium user features in your game because it increases your retention rate. If 10% of your audience is premium, and if doing and if implementing a premium specific feature is like it boosts that retention by a factor of three all of a sudden you have increased your overall retention rate by around three percent and that can mean a lot like heck just earlier i showed you that the difference between a game that's being a, a complete flop like like the, the most successful retention retain retention games day one retention that is wait i'm, I'm i missed the slide i was going for <laughs> all right yeah um no but like Was the graph? I think I just cycled way past it. Okay, yeah, yeah. So if you look, the different a three percent bump in your retention because you catered to a specific audience. Like imagine you're right here, making a like just right here, and then all of a sudden you bump at three percent. That goes from nine hundred to almost four thousand daily active users. That quadruples the total number of users in your game, just from a very because that finally triggers that discovery section. Like the discovery algorithm is logarithmic. Like that, I can't like look look at this. Um, you have my game is getting a, like right there. That's getting about a uh, five thousand daily active users from around eleven percent. Um, now look at say an adopt me, where they're getting forty percent, despite having only four. Uh, four times as many, uh, four times the retention rate. They their concurrence fact are like their daily active users is possibly up to a thousand times bigger than that other game. This stuff scales ridiculously. And uh, in terms of premium benefits, uh, well, it doesn't have to be as clear cut as exclusive. In fact, in game design in general, you shouldn't have things walled off. Uh, in my opinion. There's some debate on that. But look, you can go of it two ways. Either A, don't wall anything off. And have it so that just people who are premium members get a bump, get a starter pack. They get more money initially. So even though they aren't getting any explicit benefit, they just happen to feel cooler. Um, it won't... I mean, obviously, non-premium users are always going to be annoyed if someone else gets something that they don't have. That's just human nature. You're never going to avoid that. But will they be annoyed enough to think, oh, this is unfair? I don't think so. I mean, do an A-B test. <laughs> don't, do a focus group test. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, that's the thing. In terms of how will a certain design perform, I have my ideas. I have what I think will perform better. But at the end of the day, test it. I have seen data from other games that shows premium support improves retention. Um, I can ask them to see if they will let me to show them, but I, I won't do that. Uh, I won't be able to do that today. Anyway, the so don't like you don't have to necessarily advertise. Ah, premium members get stuff you don't. You can instead just give them the, the Lego, and even if you do allow them specific benefits, like you could also just have it so that people could buy those with like Robux. Like you could have them buy the premium thing explicitly through a separate path and have the other people just get it for free. And if you really did want to double down on having it be truly exclusive, like, 
don't get over it. Like, like if I want to, like, nine times out of ten, as long as it's not something, like, it's not so much about premium players having exclusive things. It's about what that exclusive thing entails. If the exclusive item is, uh, is something that dramatically impacts the game, where they win every time because they have that item, then, yeah, people will be angry. But, like, it really isn't any different than, like, a Fortnite skin. It, like, it, like, it doesn't have to be, at least. Because Fortnite skins, obviously, people who pay into the system have better skins to show for it and are generally prouder of their skins than the people who can't afford that obviously dislike that. And since it's a free-to-play game, the majority of people in that game aren't paying in it. Uh, but it still works because the core, the fun part of the game is not looking at the other people's skins. The fun part of the game is the Battle Royale. And this is just an augmentation. It makes you look a little bit cooler while you're doing it. But that's not why they do it. They already feel cool in whatever skin they currently have. Like, it, that's the, it's here, okay. I feel like we're going to have dance around. So, notice how the, um, let's see, oh, uh, let's see, the, notice how the experience section is a nightmare of blue. It's because it's such a complicated system. You could have premium, you could have a premium specific model in your game. Like pre you have something that rewards premium in your game, but if you do it but if you do it in a way that disincentivizes non paying players, that could backfire. And so you have that's why these are all blue, because you can't really solve for them until you test them. You can have theories, you can notice patterns and make them a little bit more toothpaste color. But that is not the same. You need to test these. If some that's why I'm telling developers, test your game from the second you the second you can test it. I I've, I've made, uh, a few weeks ago, I made a game in a week. Uh, a few months before that, I'd made a, a game in two weeks. And in my opinion, those games are me at my best. They aren't the best games I've made in terms of pure technical achievements. But they are the most resourceful, most responsible, and arguably the most, like, uh, if, like I, admit, I don't know if I ever said it, but efficient. Yeah, the... For example, the data we'll be going over today in Power BI will be from my game that I made in a week. And that game, I'm not working on it right now, but if I wanted to, it has a lot more room for growth and improvement, and I was able to make it in a week, than some games I spent years on. Because if you test early, you realize, uh, you'll find these little hidden daggers, these little things that, me that mess stuff up. Like, like, for example, my game Mortal Metal that I mentioned way back at the beginning. That failed because the map was too big. Because people couldn't find each other. Because there was too much lag. All these things that I could have checked for at the beginning. And I thought I did. But because I didn't test it. Because the game wasn't fun from day one. Unlike Bad Business, who was in my class, actually. They were in my developer class. And I watched them make their game in two weeks. Literally. They, they've inspired a lot of my, uh, um, a, a lot of that kind of stuff. Just like make a game in two weeks. Because they showed you could make a fun game in two weeks. And people were playing their game. They had the entire core experience loop done in two weeks. And they were one of the most successful games. They were, they were the most successful original IP of that, uh, of, that, of that season. Yeah, no. Test early. Make something simple. Make something ugly. But make it fun. And if it's not fun, either trash it. It was only a week or two of work. Or improve it. And that's up to you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no, I appreciate you showing up at all. It's not too often that you can get an audience of anyone, <laughs> like, uh, to show for an analytics thing. Like, I got my, my college analytics class. It had about as many people in it as we currently do now. And those people paid thousands of dollars to be there. So, yeah, the, uh, like, I don't know how everyone in the games industry, in the games uh, course, didn't take that class. But it's one of the most valuable ones I took. Anyway. Focusing on this, though, uh, yeah, no, yeah, aggressive testing and iteration, as Rathson put it. Uh, that's how you're going to solve this area. Every, all the other yellow areas, the yellow and uh, toothpaste areas, you don't got to test for that. Like, you probably should track it to make sure you didn't mess anything up. But, like, if you don't mess anything up, you can reliably know that things are going well. And if something is going wrong, you can track it down like you're debugging code. Because this is logical. This is code. This is a system. And the blues, 
That is why we need analytics. And that is going to power the rest of the presentation in many ways. Um, so a quality game to me uh, is not really something you can define, I guess. It's about fun. It's about whether or not a player would rather spend their time in this game versus not. Um, there will be games which are enjoyable, agreed upon in general by everyone to be enjoyable. And there will be games which have a very niche audience who love it. My game's one of those. Um, except me replace love with like, like with an asterisk. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's like, there's no, the fact that people, that a like-dislike ratio exists for games, where people can play the same game and have different opinions, means you will never truly have a quality game. Um, but in that way, you also will always have a quality game. So long as someone likes it, so long as you like it, you have a quality game. And the thing is, though, when people say, should I make a quality game, they aren't talking about the heart value, the, the enjoyment of it. They're talking about success. They're talking about other people agreeing it's good. And from that level, yeah, you could solve for that. Like, you can, it's pretty predictable. And you can improve upon stuff. You can, like, it's no, like, look at every field that makes up a game. The asset quality, the mechanics, the balance, the social systems in it like those are all fairly documented in how to make them better and it's fairly shown that when you make them better that aspect of the experience is generally improved for users like imagine say a uh, grand theft auto 5 versus grand theft auto 4. grand theft auto 5 is a much more beautiful game and it has a large map a very large map and i believe uh, it had it, it, it just it had so many new features. Now, it doesn't have necessarily the same mod support the other one did, which is a separate area, but in general, most people agree that GTA V is the best Grand Theft Auto game to have ever been made. And possibly the last one, depending on when GTA VI ever comes out. Um, the No, GTA V did, it took every quality of their game which was good and amplified it, and made it, um, and made it amazing, and people loved it for it, because, by and large, quality is pretty agreed upon for those smaller areas. People know when a game looks good. People know when music hurts their ears. People know when the control scheme is confusing. You can, and when people know this, they'll react to it, and when they react to it, you can test for that, and when you test for that. Well, that's just called analytics. But yeah. So, quality games through analytics. The experience system. This is, uh, we're not going to go too deep into this because really it's more to show you it exists. Um, but yeah, so we have, I probably, probably the most interesting part is uh, this one, I'd say overlooked factor, but it's overlooked possibly more by me than other people because uh, I, I, I've, I've made this mistake so many times. I keep making my maps too big. Every time. The last three games I've made, map was too big. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I keep doing it. I know it. Every time the map gets a little bit smaller. It's not working, though. Okay. Yeah. You just hire a map builder. Okay, but anyway. Uh, test your maps. Don't polish something until you've tested it. Speaking from last three games of experience where I did that. Um... But yeah, no, and I think analytics is key. I hope that by the end of this presentation, you will realize analytics is not something devs can do. It's something devs almost have to do because it is the most responsible and powerful way to improve your game. And we'll get more into that later. For now, this is this thing right here. Uh, let, let This is the uh, concurrent players increases the amount of... Uh, players per server, which obviously is influenced by the server cap, which you can set. From there, you can set the map size. You can make the map bigger or smaller. If you, if you don't bake it all in before you release it because you spent thousands on a map and you can't remove it. Okay. Um, yeah, player density. That's players per server. Like, that's the amount of players divided by the size of the map. It's not too complicated. But what you may not realize is that the reason 
one of the biggest reasons that a large map fails is because they don't talk as much. Now, this could be a few reasons. For one, it could be a very simple psychological phenomenon is when you see someone, you're more likely to talk to them. Like, if you're in the same room with someone, you're going to talk to them more often than someone on your phone. Like, technically, you could text the other person whenever you want, but you don't. You don't even, sometimes you'll get texts and just not respond. You can't do that when you're in the same room with someone. If someone says hello to you and you're standing right next to them, you can't pretend like you didn't see it. Like, I'm a fairly antisocial gamer. I don't talk to people very often. But when someone says hello to me and we're alone in the server together, right next to each other, I say hello back, even though I would have never done so otherwise. That's the, that's the beauty of player density in a server. And also, there's the fact that when you're closer to another player, you more likely have something to do with them. Like, there's more like, they more likely have to be considered. If you're playing a game, uh, a team-based battle game, and there are people right next to you saying, we're about to attack on three. One, two, three, go! Like, that's, obviously, that's talking more. You have to coordinate with them. You have to say, hey, you want to do this thing with me? You can say, like, oh, sorry, man. Like, you, like, you can, all these interactions happen. It, like, it reminds me. Like, do you know what the number one indicator of falling in love with someone is? It's proximity. Every other thing, every other thing you've ever heard about, like, wow, what, what, what makes a marriage work? It's proximity. Like, every human relationship, you need to have access to the person. It's why we're all not best friends with Will Smith. It's like, no, it's, we, we have to be near the person. And uh, that proximity, you can control that proximity in game development. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's a pretty big thing, I'd say, because messaging rate, it not only helps general retention, um, which I, I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty sure I didn't draw an arrow to this because like I was, okay, talking to people can make the game more fun and directly influence retention. I didn't draw the arrow because I couldn't find a way to connect it to that without going all the way around because uh, like, no, wait, no, I could. I guess I just didn't. Eh. I'll, I'll, I'll refine it. I'll refine it. You guys just know. Just know messaging. Players talking more often, that's a more social game. And that's a social loop. Arguably, you could say it plugs into this if this is viewed through the lens of social. That's fine. That's the problem with these blue areas. They're up for interpretation. I can say that if you want to tell me I am wrong on all this blue stuff, go for it. I'm with you. Uh, you could be right. Let's test it to find out. But you could be right. You're not right about the yellow. You're not right about the toothpaste. Because we can, that's something that we can check right now and know who's right. And I've checked, and so long as we, no one's seen anything different, I think we can safely assume this is the reality of things. But yeah, messaging rate. Messaging rate is super helpful, because it, especially with onboarding. Because if someone has a question, they'll talk to people. Like, they'll, 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 they'll be like, hey, how do I do this? And then they'll break the ice. In fact, I'd encourage not over-onboarding a game because, A, that bore the players to tears, and, B, having players talk is okay. Like, that, that helps a bit. Like, there's a balance to be found, sure, but don't immediately rule out, oh, no, not 100% of the users are getting through here. Like, you'll, you, might see, you might see that uh, improvement in one area is hurting another. Uh, and that could be messaging rates. So keep an eye on messaging rates and when you're dealing with, uh, dealing with your game. Uh, that's why I put it here, because I think it's pretty important, especially for Roblox. I'd say messaging rate stuff is very specifically a Roblox thing to consider, because not all games are social. Not all games need a full server. Many games are solo players, especially indie games, because networking is hard. Um, my goodness, that is a loud motorcycle. Oh, ah. Why are those things even legal? It's like, who's benefiting from that? Okay. It's like the population densities in the 10 blocks around me is higher than the entire population of Indiana. Okay. But yeah, the uh, back to focusing on this. Um, and actually, another thing about it, it's probably the population of Indianapolis because New York and Indiana are the same population. Okay. Anyway, back to work. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no, no. Definitely uh, tutorials... Yeah, yeah. Uh, onboarding is its own fun little thing that probably deserves its own talk, but by like a UX expert, not me. Uh, I, I'm, I've never been that good at onboarding. I've been good at onboarding when someone tells me I have an onboarding problem, how should I solve it? I'm not naturally good at it. I, I need testers to tell me, hey, I don't get this. Or the, better yet, the data. Don't trust your testers. 
if, if I can achieve one thing from this, it's that your testers can't be trusted. Um, but yeah, so from there, uh, let's move on to the, um, yeah, but actually this explains the concept a bit more. Um, you can actually, you don't always have to, you, you can solve this problem in one of two ways. Increase the map size or increase the amount of servers, uh, amount of players in your server. If you're stuck with a map this size, make a bigger server. If you're stuck with a map this size and the density is too high, because that can also be bad, um, but more in the sense that it directly impacts this rather than overall influences. Um, and also, make sure you have chat channels and, and stuff working in case you have too big, a, too big of a server. Because if it's like, you, ever, you guys ever try to chat in like the Roblox Discord server? You cannot have a conversation there. That's why Discord works, because they have those smaller channels for discussions. So make a, make a convenient way to talk to people near you. Maybe restrict chat to only certain areas if your map's too big. Uh, I've seen a few games do uh, have like in-game like texting for like chatting to people far away, which I think is pretty cool, and I might give it a try in my next game. But still, yeah, this is the social of influence. Make sure that that density is where you need it to be. Uh, from there, yeah, the core loop. This, as you may have noticed, is a reinforcing loop, kind of. I don't know. It's weird. Like, it's a reinforcing loop when it works right. Like, think about Minecraft. You have to think about Minecraft a lot as a game developer, and we're going to be using a bunch of examples from it today, because it's just, like, it is the easiest thing to dissect. Um, oh, paying testers, oh my goodness. Ooh. I cannot think of a single better way to mess up <laughs> feedback than to pay testers. Ooh, that's rough. No, but for real though, guys, um, advertise. Advertising unbiased testers is the way you need to go. In fact, to the po it's gotten to the point where I don't even trust my own like testers from my own group that much. Like I'll do it for basic testing to like get bugs out of the way, but like you need new users to test your games. You can't just rely on the same old ones because those ones are biased. Those ones will be your base. And yeah, so uh, yeah, no, uh, the, the Roblox has a built-in chat feature that almost no one uses because they don't display it. They don't tell people about it. Roblox chat, uh, the Roblox chat was, it was like it hasn't been updated in a decade, arguably. Like it's, at least in a meaningful way. Who knows, maybe with voice chat and emotes, we'll start seeing that a bit more. I'd love to have like emojis or like the, the Discord style of emojis implemented under Roblox chat so you could like emote, trigger emotes with that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, uh, the goal, uh, so goal pursuit rate, um, yeah, so this is a core loop. When everything is flowing normally, once you complete a goal, you'll have had a good time and will want to do a, a new thing. And you'll notice, I've actually included onboarding in the core loop, which not, I don't want to say not that developers do because there's going to be one person who pioneered it years before I did and realized oh, no he's, he's he's claiming credit for my work I don't hear about it very often and that is uh, that onboarding is a continuous process and I'm not talking about just tutorials I'm saying once a player learns the mechanic they will still the, the onboarding does not end once you think you know something like who here's ever done a crafting game and forgotten a recipe you have to relearn that even if you think you know the recipe, you still have to think about it. Like, the onboarding here represents the friction between deciding you want to pursue a goal and actually pursuing it. It is the friction. It is figuring out how to do that. We have onboarding problems in day-to-day -day life without realizing it. Like, uh, <laughs> last week, I was kind of tired. And for the first time in years, I put the wrong shoe on the wrong foot. I hadn't done that since first grade. Like, I'm not an idiot, I'd like to think. But I had an onboarding problem. I had an onboarding problem with my shoes. Ugh. Like, onboarding problems are continuous. So whatever system you make, you can't just make a tutorial. For one, tutorials are not good. Most tutorials, well, not many, most tutorials are not good. Teaching a player is good. Setting aside specific time for teaching them almost always takes them out of the fun. You need to find a way to keep it fun while teaching them. And that's about design. My go-to example, which, um, like the jailbreak guys, I've talked to both of them at this point, 
and they're so chill. One of them actually reached out after my uh, my video, and they're just so nice, so nice people. And I'm love it because they are also amazing game designers. Um, like Jailbreak, you, when you first spawn in the prison, I wouldn't say it's subtle, but it works great. That blue arrow, that blue arrow when you leave to show you where to get out. If that isn't playtesting related, then they have amazing instincts because they show the player, okay, when you exit your cell, you immediately know which direction to go to get out. It is natural. You know what you're doing. You did not have to go through a tutorial. It's just you running through the hallways. And then once you're out, you'll see, like, there's, there, there's such, it's almost comedic levels of, like, they embraced the absurdity of onboarding in some senses. And I like, just stuff like, like, please don't punch me to, like, this one electrical sign. And so what do you do? You punch it. And then that's just, they just think, they only do that, though, for, like, the really obvious ones. Like, to, there are other ways to escape, if I remember correctly, that aren't as obvious. But the point is, players, on their first time through, they know what to do. And in fact, on their second time through, if they've forgotten, how do I escape, how do I get this panel open again? It's like, they're trying different hotkeys, and they're, they're trying things, they're like, oh, punch it. Okay. Like, onboarding is about communication, continuous communication of sometimes very complicated concepts. And that, 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 that's why I've included it there. And I think I might have just spoiled the next slide. Um, kind of. Okay. Anyway, Minecraft survival mode. That's, this is, it's the core loop, in most cases, is described as core actions. And yes, asterisks. Because this core loop, it's one I've actually presented before. In fact, I think I yanked this from a previous slide. Um, this is good for viewing how your mechanics interact with each other. And that's an important thing to consider. This is not a bad design loop. In fact, my previous systems presentation was mostly about how systems interact with each other. Basically, the kind of stuff you, you learned about here, except applying to specific games. And, well, I hate to break it to you, but thanks to the social loop, the having fun with new people. Thanks to that, you. I feel bad saying this. You really don't need that many mechanics in your game. Who here has ever been to like a coffee shop role play? What mechanics are there? There's like an espresso button. My Keurig has the same mechanics as that game. But this isn't a diss. This is just the absurdity of game design. It's because that game with just the single mechanic of just dressing up and and and, uh, and making coffee, they've, they've captured an audience. It's great because the fantasy doesn't need any more than that. You just need the immersive environment. You don't need any. You don't need a progression loop. You don't need. Uh, you don't. Need, you don't need daily rewards. Like you, you don't need any of that stuff because a well-crafted mechanic can be enough if it's paired very well with the social loop. And heck, you don't need a single mechanic. You know what Discord is? It's just a raw, unfiltered social loop. It is, the, it is a fun conversation you can have with strangers. Like, that is, that is what Discord is. Discord did not need a single game mechanic beyond social loops. And Roblox offers you that social loop for free. And so really, you don't, don't stress too much about the explicit mechanic design in your game. Make it work with the players. By all means, if you can get mechanics to bounce off each other, your game could be better for it. You just have to pull it off. And that can be difficult, as my previous uh, presentation discussed. But yeah, so, um, which by the way, I, I shouldn't reference it. Don't watch it. I wrote it on 40 hours of no sleep. It's not that great. I was very tired. Um, but yeah, so what really I'd argue that core loops need to be is take these different, uh, diff different tasks and really abstract them to goals because each one of these is a goal it is saying I want to mine now I should survive now I should craft now most of my life in New York has been I should survive now um, middle and success rate please uh, devs please balance um, with with the goal pursuit rate and I think let me talk through exactly what's happening here you onboard the player like, uh, sorry, so the player sees a goal and decides, I want to pursue this goal. And to some extent, this probably should be a double, 
a bouncing, the Charlotte should be a bouncing loop right here because you shouldn't, you can't add infinite goal options. They will get overwhelmed. But having multiple goals to choose from, such as I should mine this tree, I should walk that way, I should hide, whatever. Like, if you give players multiple options, both extrinsic, uh, extrinsic means when the developer codes the thing specific, like into the game. Extrinsic uh, motivations are the, uh, it's natural disaster survival telling you you need to survive. Intrinsic motivations are you going to the highest point and then using a dance emote as the tornado wipes out the building. You didn't have to do that, but you are, had a lot more fun because you did. And a designer, while they can't technically add intrinsic loops, they can predict them. Like, just anyone who's had experience with games, uh, like, actually, this is probably an example of negative, uh, of negative intrinsic goal prediction, where whenever I have a customization game, I know I need to have a few safeguards in place, because whenever you give the player the chance to customize, they might, they're going to try to make something awful. Like, like they, especially with my game Night Ships, I was thinking of all these weird ship shapes, which I would not want people to make and then make a video about. So that's predicting intrinsic goals. Uh, and yeah, so you need to give them goals. Intrinsic and extrinsic doesn't matter. They need to have those goals. And then once they've considered the goal, what percent of players pursue this goal? And once they've pursued that play, once they've made, uh, made clear that they want this to happen, how many of them survive onboarding? How many of them realize, I want to do this, but then go, oh, wait, I don't know how. How many of them get through that part? And then once they've gotten through that part, how many of them actually accomplish the task? How many of them actually reach that, that, uh, that goal? Um, and with all of those, and by the way, not reaching your goal, that can either be them quitting or that can be just them never achieving it, like them failing. Like it can, uh, so it's not necessarily as clear. It's that that's why I'm doing it based on success, a success rate, because there are a hundred different reasons you could fail. But if you have a clear idea of what the success scenario is, you can track for that. You can measure for that. And that's the thing. These blue areas, they're so complicated. So there's so many nested systems here. All you can do is sort of check the temperature. And that's why your doctor says you are a certain degrees warm rather than a certain degrees cold compared to like, I don't know, the heat, like, like the center of a star. Like they don't say, oh, you're negative 5 million degrees Kelvin. Because no. That, eh. Okay. Focusing. What you need to keep your game interesting is these goals layered. Who here likes Shrek? Let me provide you the game design onion. Um, we have the player and their immediate goal. For example, in Minecraft, you've, let's, we're assuming you just started Minecraft, like you just entered the game. What do we want to do first? Okay, let's find a tree. Okay, yeah, oh, there's a tree over there. Cool. Found a tree. Did that in five seconds. That's just... Okay, 30 seconds. Okay, I started punching these blocks and now I'm uh, like, like I'm trying to get, I'm going to try to get wood. So I'm going to go towards that tree, start punching blocks, and next thing you know, I've mined wood. They accomplished that. People can usually get through this part. Now, okay, I have wood. Now what? Uh, you need to craft something. And that's, this is, if I had to guess, this is where the drop-off happens. This is where new users get, uh, start getting lost. And I'm not saying that, like, Minecraft has a pretty okay onboarding the crafting system is crafting games are really bad it's at, 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 at uh, providing the recipes to the users I don't know what the deal is but I there I there are so many crafting games which I have to look up like the recipes online I shouldn't have to do that um, yeah devs be better I feel probably shouldn't be saying that because otherwise you're gonna look at my games and be like ooh. Should he really be criticizing games? Um, yeah, the... Uh, no, but crafting the workbench. You have people... Uh, like, you have... That's like the minute goal. And so you craft it, craft the workbench, and then with the workbench, you can now craft the wooden pickaxe, and then from there, you can find a cave, and there you can find iron. But the thing is, not only for a game to be fun and compelling... This is not just me saying the player should do these things in a row, because here's the thing. Like, why wouldn't I just draw a line from A to B to C to Z? Like, why not just draw a line directly through there? Because this is actually happening at once. This is the player's cognition. When you join Minecraft, you know what you want to do. You want to find iron. 
That's your goal. In order to get there, you know the steps you need to take to get that. This is the player thinking, what do I, what am I going to, what am I doing now? What do I, why am I doing that? Why do I want to do 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 that? And it's to find iron. And like, that's the thing. Like, this is the player comprehending all of this at once. I've ended it at about six or seven because really players don't think about that stuff because players have a limit for how much they can remember at once. So don't like overload them with goals, but making sure that you have some spaced out, ideally in a sort of a logarithmic way to get expanded over time. Um, because, and as a player accomplishes a goal, it needs to be refilled. If the player finds iron, they should have this much worth of stuff still in their head. When they find a tree, once they've started mining trees, it just unlock new things behind find iron. Like, you need to keep adding stuff. You need to keep supplying them with new interesting goals. Uh, and from there, it's like, let's see. And I think I talked about, I, I spoiled this earlier. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Like, you, the player has the craft workbench goal. And then from there, they decide, okay, I want to make a workbench. And like, that's the thing. This, this, this system is for every one of these goals. They are at a different stage in this system for all of them. And you can't even really tell if they're pursuing it until they get there. Like, that's the difficult part about tracking this stuff. You don't know if they were looking for iron. Once they find iron, once they go follow this certain path to iron, you can then contextualize, like, okay, they were trying to find iron. But, yeah, like, arguably, this is probably the one area where you will still probably need playtesters because you can't read their mind. That, that's, that's just the reality. And when your game relies on intrinsic goals, uh, to some extent, you have to ask them. You have to, you have to measure that. It won't be reliable, but it might, you might be able to give you an idea of what's happening so you can test for that in a reliable way. Um, like, uh, from there, yeah, so crafting the workbench. They do all this stuff. And this, as I said, this loop is actually, uh, for each one of these little boring loops, it has this. And at every moment, it is going. the player is going through all of those loops at once and making new loops and removing old loops as they're accomplished and just progressing in a linear fashion through this chain of loops. And I'd say that this people failing to create this, to create consistent long-term loops, that is the reason most games on Roblox fail. It is because a player, because typically devs are okay at mechanic design. They're like, oh, this was fun. You'll get all those. You'll get those tweets on Twitter, which get thousands of likes, and be like, "Oh wow, that's so cool! That was amazing!" And then, like, you play the game, and it's boring. It's because, a, or even a movie trailer. This, I think that's a great example. Think of a movie trailer with the that that went that was cool. Now that was a good two and a half minutes of movie. A movie isn't two and a half minutes long. A movie can be up to two and a half hours long these days. Sometimes three if the director is really pretentious. And with that, you kind of, like, where, like, basically the advertisement is saying the majority of this movie is not stuff that we can market to you as interesting. It's, and that's the part, problem. Because all these, all these things, they're bite-sized goals that you can understand. But if you don't track how well a player is progressing through them and when these kind of gaps appear, like let's say that instead of crafting a workbench, you just told them to find a cave. What if that was their first step and they spawned a place far away from caves? They'll go a good five minutes without knowing what to do. And anyone who's seen like a player uh, quit chart will know you'll, you can lose like a good majority of your players in the first five minutes. Like you can lose 80%. If you don't, if you if you don't do it right, heck, you can lose thirty. You can lose twenty uh, to thirty percent in the first minute. Like that, I've seen that happen to games all all the time. Um, and yeah, so like, you need to make sure that these goals always exist, and not only that they exist, but that they are compelling. Really, looking at this, finding a tree and mining wood, it's not that interesting. It's not super interesting, but. What it is, is a, it's a path. It's a step to the next thing. And you'll notice games that are described as grindy, as like, where like you're bored, 
but you do it to get to the long-term goals, that's when these immediate goals aren't, aren't interesting. Can you imagine if someone described, like, Fortnite as a grind? Like, ugh, I keep having to, 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 do, to play the game to get new skins. And, like, maybe someone who really cares about the skins and doesn't care about the game will feel that way. But most players play it because the game's the fun part. Because the the, the, ten, the the tenseness of going through things, that's fun. Because it's not necess- even though they love winning, the game is fun when they lose as well. You can't just have the final goal be interesting. Otherwise, your game will feel grindy. Make every goal as interesting as you can possibly make it. Whether that be through crisp sound design and a, like a fun little popping effect for Minecraft. That, that mining's fun to some extent. Like when you mine bricks or blocks. That's somewhat enjoyable. And it, when you're actually mining under the ground, there's sort of that little uh, suspense of like, am I about to come across a diamond, iron? There's uncertainty. That's interesting. Mining can be interesting. And that's the 30 second loop. One minute loop, that's also interesting. Two minutes, like that's the thing. The more of these that you can get in and the more interesting you can make them, that is your game's success. That is where your game does well. And from there, you have this little swoopy hair uh, yeah, it looks kind of like a face. Uh, but yeah, no. I guess we'll uh, just move on to the next part. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> the... A- a- adding uh, Ed here to the system, you can kind of see how this entire loop just plays over and over again with different levels of goals. And since that entire area before was kind of misleading with the uh, with the various... Like, you may, it makes it look like it's a one-and-done thing, when really... It is this entire stack of goals layered on top right here. And you need to track all of them because if a single one of these is messing up, you're losing players. You might not lose all of them, but you're losing them. Yeah, and so from there, we have, uh, yeah, so now, so that's the experience system. That's what you need to figure out. Now that we understand what this means, we can also better appreciate uh, this area where if certain goals uh, take longer, like say that you have, Say, say that you focus on just, uh, on like, what if you stretch these goals by 10%? Maybe this take, like, this takes 11 minutes, this takes 5.5, this takes 2.2, 1.1, 33 seconds, 6 seconds. If you stretch it just a little bit, it might not be as fun, but you'll get a longer session duration. See? It lowers the enjoyment, but in a way that increases the session duration, which increases the number of concurrent players, which increases the amount of players in the server as well as a bunch of stuff like retention which increases the messaging rate which increases the enjoyment of the game so technically there's an argument here for lengthening certain mechanics just for the reason that it will make your game longer because it loops back around into making this making onboarding a bit easier. Because if your game's a bit longer, there are more players in it at once. And there are more people talking. More people having fun together. And so it's weird. That's why I mapped this out. That's why the system's so important. Why, that's why this is a model. Because you need to understand it. Because that kind of thing of when do I make the me- my mechanic a little bit longer? If you, ha- if you didn't see this entire system and everything tied together, there's no way you would have thought, ah, I should increase the average duration a bit to get people to talk more. Like, maybe, maybe if you're super talented, by all means, go for it. Be, be cool. But I know that most people, or maybe just me, maybe I'm stupid, would not have gotten that. And that's why these models matter. Because you have to look through how a single change in one area is tied to everything else. And the more you can consider that, the more you will avoid setbacks, the more efficient you can be as a developer. Because your job is getting smaller and smaller, but this is still where it matters, in this blue area where these messes of systems all work together. And yeah, so that is, uh, that's the meta model. That is all of it. That is why games succeed. It is a fairly massive thing, looking at it like this. It looks intimidating, but now that you've gone through it with me, It makes sense. Like, you can imagine how it all fits together. You can see there isn't a space for a good game to go unappreciated. If your game is good, it can succeed. 
Be, like if you if you get this if you have this part right, and then get even a thousand users to play your game, it'll flow through. The reinforcing loops will amplify it. That amplification will bring more discovery players, which will lead to that. And those reinforcing loops will take stuff away. The only balancing loop holding back your system is like the reality that you lose a bit of momentum every time you like with uh, the experience because not every player is going to like it. But also, uh, and there's also kind of a sort of a rebound with like when a game gets too popular, people start having lashback against it, like with Minecraft or Roblox or Adopt Me. Like people will love it at first, but then be like, "Oh, not that game." Eh. It's annoying, but by that point, you're a millionaire, so who cares? Yeah, so like, this is all solvable. And I think that's very important. I think it's the most important thing you can learn from today. That your fate is more or less in your hands. This is a strategy game. The rules have been set. These are the rules. What's your move? And yeah, so that it's the end of part one. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Woo! Yeah. Thank, yeah, no, no, thank you all for showing up. I'm surprised we able to keep 10 this long. I kind of thought that'd be the boring section. You know? You know, like, the, 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 the mapping out of, your enti of like the entire Roblox economy. That's the boring part. So, hopefully the next part's more interesting. Uh, yeah, so... Back here. How the heck do we track this? Because, like, here's the thing. I can fool a bunch of you by using a bunch of, like, very powerful language. Like, here, and be like, oh, yeah, you just got to loop it. It's like an onion, bro. Yeah, you know ogres? Like, like you, uh... <laughs> What's that mean? Our brains are so good at tricking us into thinking things make sense. It's half the reason people show up to these talks. Like, it's... When you try to break it down to numbers, it gets really messy really quickly. And so for that, well, let's actually see what it looks like. Because here's the thing. Game designers have loops. Players, they just have, they just have play sessions. They just have the experience they had. It's a linear thing. They aren't looping. They aren't going back and forth. At any one moment, they're experiencing something and they're thinking about something else. They're seeing what's ahead down the road. Like, they travel down the path, they see, oh, a bench is up there. <laughs> I guess, like a park bench in, in, in the second context. But like, they see goals ahead, hopefully. Like, uh, and in fact, you can think of this as like a path up a, up a mountain. They see the peak, and they want to get to that peak. And they see little obstacles ahead, and they work towards those. Uh, and because of that, there's visual, you have a visual, uh, navigation of your part and location in your journey. And that is what the player experiences. And if you, if they can't see too bad, if, if your path's too windy, they might not be able to see those long-term goals. Uh, so yeah, that's, each one of these players has their own unique experiences with little differences. For example, with this one, this person crafted, uh, took, got some wood from a tree, made a bench, then went back and mined two more trees for a pickaxe. I don't remember if that's, if that's the exact amount of trees you needed for any of these recipes, but, you know. Uh, from there, you have uh, tree mining. Uh, so you have, like, uh, you can have the person who just starts, maybe they spawn in a forest. Uh, they they just mine a bunch of trees uh, and I guess see a tree at the end. I think I messed that part up, but, you know. Uh, oh, no, they see a tree, and I guess they maybe they build their bench near a tree and then mine that tree immediately after. Uh, maybe they forget that they need one more tree point is, they do the same amount of work at the end of it, except for this guy, and we'll get to them. Um, but it's in a different order. So you can't track this. Like Even though it is a map, even though it is a path, it's a path which is different for every user in some way. Uh, and because of that, well, yeah, so we have the exact same thing here, except then at the last second, they, re they, they, they say, jokes on you, I'm not going to get a pickaxe. I'm going to get a regular axe to mine more wood. And it branches again. And that's the key, it's branching. And so you can simplify it a bit as a game designer. You can, you can combine those experiences. You can make some shorthands. You can say, okay, we're just going to assume that everyone's doing the same thing, and when they aren't doing the same thing, we're going to split from there. And you can do that a few times, and it helps. But then you uh, kind of have the issue where 
what happens if this person mines more, like this person mines two trees, whereas this person only mines one? Like, uh, sorry, like it's, it's different. They're now in a different situation. They're in a different path, even though technically it might not even matter that much. It might just be something small and, and unnecessary. Like, imagine you're tracking a literal player path. If they go left around a tree or right around a tree, it probably won't matter that much. And so these smaller things that don't matter, such as the specific process of them finding and mining trees, you can reduce those. And you can, you can reduce those, uh, like for example, in this one, we literally just assume whenever they mine a tree, they have in fact found a tree. And if no one's mining trees, that means no one is finding trees or something's going along there. So unless you have reason to believe people are failing to do something, don't explicitly track it. It'll make your life so much easier. Like, if you really want to be careful, track it. But like, also, not everyone has infinite data storage. And you can only send so many events at once through HTTP service. So yeah, don't track tiny things that don't matter. Like if it's not, if, if this goal is pretty established, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I, I, I'm, I'm so very happy to finally be able to share all this with people. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, so you have these different tracks. And by removing the unnecessary stuff, you just get the, you get the goals. But then you still have the duplication issue where, um, and to fix that, we do the opposite of duplication, deduplication. And deduplication, it, uh, a bit of a wonky term, I guess. Basically, instead of having these two events twice in a row, you have these two events and include in properties of the event the, the average amount of duplications. And then you can later on filter various level of duplications. Like if a person mines three trees in a row, how does that impact whether they make a regular X or a pickaxe? Like it, 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 uh, it's a, we're gonna be talking about it a bit, something called states, but the duplication is a variable added to the event's state. Um, or I guess the player state. And yeah, so we can then deduplicate it. And from there, you may realize, the astute among you, that path is the same path now. These, up to this point, it's the same. So we can actually merge it into a very simple, um, a very simple flow, which here ended up being uh, people, like, for some reason, mining a tree after they made a bench. I really think I messed up some of the labeling at some point. I think it's because I did this earlier. No, but more or less, like, that's the thing. I messed up as the developer. But through reducing things and through analytics and like solving for it, you can actually kind of see that. Like, I, this is so meta. I literally messed this part up and I'm able to see that because of this exact system. This kind of stuff's great. It's super helpful for narrowing stuff down and figuring out when something makes sense and when it doesn't. Like if you were to see, for example, that people were just starting with going directly to pickaxe and never mining, then you either have a bug or there's just like a lot of wood lying around them or something. Because I, like you can find those weird instances. You can even detect hackers. Like a, a person who spawns with a pickaxe, that's a hacker. But don't like auto ban anyone who spawns with pickaxe. Check for bugs first. I, um, a colleague of mine once, oh, it was one of the funnier moments I've ever streamed. A colleague of mine tried to stop hackers by banning people who got a sudden increase in, in, in cash in their game, except they didn't, they didn't filter out those who had just bought the most expensive developer product. So on the stream, one of the people on it with me bought their most expensive product to support them because they thought it was a good game and were banned for hacking instantly. <laughs> oh, it was great. Oh, no, yeah, check that stuff. Check that stuff with a fine tooth comb, especially with your paying players. I cannot think of a worse business decision than to perma ban your most dedicated players. <sighs> oh my goodness. That's hilarious. Okay. You're in the audience. I'm so sorry. It's just it's the best story. Mm. Anyway. This is simplification. See this, see these player paths? You can now reduce this to this. And uh, really, in all honesty, like in, you know, like in real life, you will have tens of thousands of players. And you will have 
every one of these could branch into five or so different things. Like you could branch out to a dozen things from any mo from any moment. So we need to find a way to automate it. And to automate it, let's abstract a little bit more. So we have this. But why? And that is the key. Why do some people choose a pickaxe and some people choose a regular axe? That, in this model that we've created, why are some people going with the pickaxe? I don't know. Like, theoretically, you guess that most people would make a regular axe. Like, that isn't technically shown in this data, but like, because with a regular axe, you can cut down more trees faster. And at the moment, that's the only thing they know, cutting down trees. But a pickaxe, well, that person's a little more forward-thinking. So when do, what, type, what types of players are more forward-thinking? And what types of players just go for the regular axe? You, probably, you, can, you can ponder it yourself. Because humans are actually OK at solving these kind of problems, De determining uh, underlying causes for certain behaviors. Uh, it's why you can have a conversation with someone. If you don't know how a person's going to act, if you can't predict that behavior, you would never interact with them because they could be dangerous. You could, if you walk up to someone and they punch you in the face immediately after you say hello, well, you're not going to walk up to them. So when you walk up to someone, you're predicting that they won't do that. And most of the time, they won't. So yeah, no, we're OK at predictions, despite what people say. Like, when we mess it up, yeah, it can be bad. But nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, honestly, you do an all right job. Um, I was a little bit behind the curve on that one. I was never super great at predicting that kind of stuff. But, uh, I mean, you know me. They, they, they had an entire video about how I'm on the spectrum. And even then, it just, you know. Anyway, so focusing on all that stuff. Uh, okay, yeah. We can simplify down to here. Uh, the key decision, because really... If these aren't interesting decisions, like if we made a game where, say, say, what if you tracked, like, the amount of steps you took. Every time a person took a step, or, like, like, pressed a key on their keyboard, it recorded an event. Most of those don't matter, and most of those aren't interesting. Most of those don't impact your game. You kind of need to decide what areas of this will be interesting. And that's why core loops matter. If we go all the way back to here... Um, if we go all the way back to here, we have these interesting moments. When someone says they enjoy Minecraft survival mode, it's because of mining, crafting, or surviving. Those are the three reasons. Like, it, and so you want to focus your events. You don't want to just record every time they see a tree. That's a waste of your time. That's a waste of your budget. No. You, you track. You track the interesting decision. And this stuff, if you really, like, but that's the thing, though, like, what, what if people aren't learning how to make a bench? That's still an interesting decision. It's not one that really mattered here, because everyone figured out how to make a bench. So, interesting decisions are the ones that matter, but some overall tracking of just necessary decisions. Basically, things that will, in, that will dramatically impact the player's uh, session. That, those are the ones you're tracking. Not the, did they mine a tree? Or did they find, do it? Or did they look at tree? Maybe do it. Do a first time check of do they know how to mine trees? Like that's that's important. So like you don't have to, but like after they've mined their first tree, that can just be a checkbox. You don't have to fire every time they mine a tree. Like you don't need that. Like yeah, onboarding is a like a regular process, but the person isn't going to mine one tree and then one minute later think, how do I mine trees again? Like it, it's click. Like, like, if you do a good job on the actual onboarding stuff, you won't really need to track it too much. Um, like, maybe do a basic checkbox every time they return or every hour or so. Like, that's up to you. You can configure it based on your own game. Another loud motorcycle going by. Yeah. I don't even know why. The speed limit here is like 20. Like, um, I can bike faster than half these people. Uh... My bike doesn't even wake up the, the neighbors. So, anyway. Key decision. And that actually brings us to one of my favorite and probably most overused quotes in game design. Games are a series of interesting decisions, but guess what? He was right. Is right. I, I don't know. I think this was from a while back. So, I, I hope he still agrees with it. Because from what I could tell, it fits perfectly. 
Uh, the Think of a game. Any game. Like, uh, what makes it different from a movie? And that's kind of, and you may be thinking, okay, well, in a movie I can't do anything. That's true. You can't. You, you're a passive audience. And it's also, uh, and that's because you aren't deciding anything. You're not influencing the outcome. You don't have a say. It's not about you. You get to maybe empathize with characters that uh, you see on screen, and you might get emotionally involved in it. But a game, but games are about decisions. There's a difference between a focus group test and a play test. The these decisions are, I'd say, the core of great games. Because if you look at, say, a uh, even natural disaster survival, a game where you seemingly don't have too much agency, it kind of highlights what uh, how important these decisions are because. Anyone can watch the movie like 2012. 2012 is a movie where the world ends in kind of a natural disaster survival way. In fact, I wonder if they inspired each other because I think natural disaster survival came out in 2012 as well. Um, but yeah, the <clears throat> or maybe it was 2008. No, I think it was 2012. No, it was two, I, I was there in 2008. I started 2008. It was not then. 2012. <coughs> Might have been 2011. Um, we're just over halfway through. I've run out of water. <laughs> um, the yeah, so it's because that's what makes games more replayable than movies are rewatchable. You have a movie uh, that you may rewatch once a week if it's really good, but that's like the best one. Even a bad game you can replay once a day. I have some really bad games on my phone that I'll play whenever I'm bored, when I have nothing else to do. Like I'm in like the transitional periods uh, between activities. They're not great games. I have still replayed them more than my favorite movies. And that's because the decision part makes things unique, makes things interesting. It's the part you should be caring about. Uh, and yeah, so let's focus on those. And from there, we need to figure out why. The why of what... So if we have one ingredient here, the state going into the decision, what about this is outputting different paths? What is changing here that is leading to different paths? And I'd say it goes into these three categories. These aren't like, these are vaguely defined. I think they're helpful. You can reorganize them in whatever way you like. But yeah, the historic path, um, well, I think I, I'll just show it. We'll be using a, uh, an anonymous player um, for these. So the base, uh, the, um, the base states. So let's start with that. So base, dynamic, and historic. The base state, this is the stuff you have when you enter the game. It's, they, end, they start the session with it. Like, you, you should assume that this stuff will stay the same throughout the entire thing. And because of that, you might be able to save some storage space by just sending it once and then merging it onto the other tables. Um, I've seen people do that before. Uh, and uh, I would recommend it. I, I think that that can be very helpful. Um, especially with Power BI, because you can actually, uh, having multiple tables is the goal. So you can have events launched at the beginning, events launched throughout the session, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to that later. But the point is, this is the stuff that doesn't change. This is, these are the things like their language, their platform, their account age, screen resolution, uh, and even stuff like session ID, because session ID is very important. Roblox does not track session ID, so you have to use it, create one during a, using a HTTP service, which means that uh, uh, you, to uh, generate GUID, which is a universally... Uh, uh, which is a unique identif identifier. Uh, and because of that, session IDs uh, are very important to track because a person's first play session and their second play session will be very different. And a person who teleports between places, well, it'll say they left the game. And that's the thing. If you just track when they exit, you won't realize that, oh, wait, they teleported somewhere else. So if you include a session ID in their data, you can just weave together what session, like, like what, what's part of a continuous session, and even include, have analytics track between uh, place teleports. So yeah, no, session IDs are very important. Um, yeah. The, uh, all the other stuff is important at times, 
Like, uh, account age, I'd say, is important for if your game is difficult. You can't really do... Like, you can't or probably shouldn't do an IQ test for your game. But, I mean, you know, a three-year-old's going to be stupider than a 20-year-old. Most of the time. You'd think. And so if you want to just do a... Figure out, like, if, there, if, you, if, there's, a, if there's an age curve where, like, uh, just certain things... Or I guess reading is probably a good example. Like... Uh, reading is one that, like, let's say that you have a lot of text in your games. People who are still learning how to read and aren't as comfortable with it, there's going to be some friction there. Some friction which might influence them to make a different choice. The one that involves less reading. And so you need to track that. And, uh, yeah, if you could try, if you have to make a decision between tracking more states or tracking more events, track more states because you need to figure out what is happening here. This is a mystery box and you need to solve it by uh, figuring out exactly what kinds of uh, things influence it. And that is the heart of analytics. Uh, and the and so language, once again, reading, if your game isn't well, uh, isn't well translated, or even worse, there's just not enough people in there who speak the same language as them, so they can't talk to anyone. Like, I, I have always advocated for uh, language-specific servers being an option, if not the default, because... Frankly, like it's not you can't progress like you can't you can't know other languages inherently. Like you like no matter how much I want to know what a person is saying, if they speak a language I don't speak, I I don't know. I I can maybe get some context out of what they want to say, but I can never know exactly what they're saying. And so yeah, like language is a very important thing, and if possible, try to make sure that people always have players in the game who speak the same language because if like, remember that uh, problem from before with the uh, with uh, messaging rate being important and how that affects everything and how like play like uh, map sizes matter. Your player density, as far as I'm concerned, in a social game, your player density is multiplied by the percentage of users in the server who speak your language. And if that's 10%, that's bad. Yeah, like that that'll that'll influence stuff. And that's arguably why Roblox has had such a hard time. Uh, growing in international markets, like now, don't get me wrong, they're growing amazingly. But like, the reason, like these 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 countries have had internet a lot longer than Roblox has been popular there, and the delay is because it's just difficult to get people to play a social game when they can't speak the same language. Like there's just there's just uh, there's friction there. But yeah, second one's dynamic. Dynamic stuff uh, it changes in the moment. It's stuff that you need to watch out for, uh, but you and you have to check every time. Like, this is the stuff you solve for every time you send an event. Uh, you check what their health is. Um, max health, in this case, I'm assuming max health is changing. Uh, ping, that can change. Like, if FPS drops during an event, an event and all of a sudden everyone's quitting, because quitting is an event you'll want to track for sure. Well, like, that's important. Like, you can't ignore that, because that means your game has a performance issue. And it means that that performance issue is very key to the enjoyment. Like, there are games I know that I love. Like, uh, there's this game called Teardown, which plays at, like, 20 frames per second half the time for me. But that's fine, because it's kind of inevitable. And they knew that going in, that it was going to be slow. And you can change your graphics settings for people who, who uh, want to have it at a higher resolution rather than a higher visual fidelity. That's okay to have a low FPS, but you have to make sure it's not influencing player behavior. And a lot of time it does. That's the reality. Um, the game I made in a week, there's lag. It, it has a lot of physics simulations, and that hurt it. Um, in terms of uh, currency and max health, like you can guess how these influence stuff. Like that's the right. Like I don't need to explain all this to you. You know, you can look at these and think of how it's useful. And if you don't, uh, ask away. Like an answer. But in reality, like and then historic. Historic's the final one. Uh, historic. Uh, is stuff typically dynamic, but sometimes base, like from base stuff from previous sessions. Like say that when they first played, they were on PC and now they're on mobile. You, that's 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 a state. That, that's that's historic state. Like stuff like their deaths, how much they've spent. Um, I, I uh, guessing this was health change, but I forgot to change it. <laughs> Ironic. Um, yeah, and friends made all that stuff. Yeah, it's uh, 
these are important for when like the past is important for context. Like say that this person, for example, is considering going down path two, and they but they match all the characteristics of someone who'd go down path one. Why wouldn't they go down path one? Oh, it's because they've already gone down path one and now want to go down path two. That's historic context. That's that's part of the state which you need to track. And though luckily though. In general, historic doesn't need to be explicitly tracked in-game. To save storage, you generate historic data in the actual, uh, power, in the actual analytics tool, in our case, Power BI. Um, but yeah, so with all of that in mind, don't, you, don't need, uh, the, you might need to track it a few times, though. There, there are a few edge cases where you might want to track historic data, and also sometimes just because uh, it's, it might be easier. Like, right, like if you have to do a calculation a million times every time you compile your code or your analytics like and you like removing a single calculation could save you a minute a minute of time and that, that's not nothing so sometimes you can just explicitly put stuff just because the calculation to solve for it later um, is boring like technically you can you can guess what a player's session ID is and assign that to them later don't do it because that's painful I've tried it it spent like I took it two days and it barely even worked. It had a huge error margin. There were a lot of edge cases that could have screwed it up. Store this bit of technically historic data. Like if someone joins a teleports and is passed the session ID, that's technically historic data. But I don't know. It's a, it's a system. These are categorizations. You can change them and mess with them as you like. Point is, these are the three general types of state. And when you integrate it into the system, all of a sudden you can see it's not in fact the state going into this black box. It is these lists of, of important information all kind of influencing the decision. It's actually kind of similar to a neural network to anyone out there who's interested in that stuff. In fact, you could probably, like long term, the reason we won't have careers in 30 years is because someone will do that. Someone will take, I, I said at the beginning of this presentation, anything that's blue, um, well, in this case, this one just happens blue. This would have been blue too. Anything that's uncertain or, or measurable but not solvable, that's something you solve with a neural network. And long term, our jobs are going to get automated with neural networks for this exact reason. Because you can look at the various bits of state and automate out what path they will take and run a simulation on how that influences the overall game and then solve for that overall context. This is your job for now. So we're going to teach you how to do that before the machines take it. Yeah, so... Uh, Let's see, the actual path, like, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, what, what, what am I talking about here? Okay, yeah, so that, right now I'm just saying this is, but so you know the path before? This is, uh, this is sort of the, the starting point of a, a player experience. This is an interesting moment in, in a game such as uh, you attacking with a, a flamethrower. This is, player has a flamethrower, they're attacking. Uh, what, what does that mean in, their, in the game? What state, what, what, uh, what uh, like, the, the, okay, so these are the things you track. Like, with, so with the specific decision, like, you track the state, and you just track, then you track the data related to the specific decision. So, like, this is what you include in the event related to this specific decision. The state stuff will be applied everywhere. You will generate the state in the same way for every decision. But the decision information, that's this kind of stuff. That's what category the decision's in, if you want to do some basic loop tracking. What label to give it, uh, that can be super helpful, especially for Sankey charts, which we'll get to later. Uh, what weapon they're using, so like instances where they might change specific objects in game for others. Uh, how well they performed it, did they damage anyone? Um, you can even solve for later on if it influenced uh, their performance negatively. Um, like whenever I play with fire, I'm pretty sure it lowers my life expectancy a little bit. Yes. And from there, uh, you can see, like, so you now know exactly, this is the data you track for the state. This is the data you track for an event. By the way, this is not a finite list. You can add more stuff, and you don't have to add this stuff. Like, there's no point to add a weapon category for, like, for like a for like a, ch a chat event or something, you know, uh, and this is the final event model. This is how this works. Uh, like, that's how you're going to be tracking stuff. 
And because of that, you can solve for which path is the ideal player experience. Um, this and a most certainly existing reality where this happened. Uh, yeah, and from there, now that you can track all these specific predictions for how players move through your game, how does that help us here? Like, yeah, we can get, okay, they go down certain paths, but going down certain paths does not necessarily translate into going down more paths. It does not necessarily translate into spending more on certain paths. Like, you have to translate the paths taken by players into something which is compatible with this. And that is where you solve for KPIs, key performance indicators. Now, key performance indicators are uh, super useful. There's no finite list. Like, if you are having trouble in any of these areas, by all means, track for it and track your improvement over time. Because, like, if we learn that, say, they have a horrible onboarding experience, we'll want to track for that as a general key performance indicator as well because it influences all the ones that matter. But in general, track these ones. Figure out your attention rates, figure out how long they're playing, and figure out how much they're spending. Uh, that's, this would be in the form of average revenue per user. And yeah, so that's, uh, these, are, these are the important parts. We solve for these. And we figure out how certain paths influence uh, these various uh, metrics. We can have positive, one way to do this is through positive correlations. This is the way we measure. This is where we take a complicated system like survival rate, like we take the measurement from survival rate it doesn't directly translate into retention rate. And then we figure out how often it kind of it kind of does. A positive correlation goes from uh, 0. Point infinitely small to 1. Uh, negative correlation goes to negative from 0 to negative 1. Uh, and no correlation, well, that's just a 0. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, the same thing is positively. When something's positively correlated, change in A uh, equals a change in B. Negative change in A equals opposite change in B, and no correlation means changing A does not affect B at all. Uh, yeah, you'll notice the green and red lines are also correlations. This is pretty basic stuff, uh, the, but important. Secondly, now that you have a way to actually determine whether or not a certain behavior is influencing things, you need to filter. Because, here's the thing. <laughs> Did you know that <laughs> Uh, what, what, let's see, what, uh, what's a good example? It's like, ha it's like, did you know that the average uh, motor vehicle in the United States has less than four wheels, but more than two? Like, technically, because motorcycles exist, the average number of, of uh, wheels on a, on a motor vehicle goes down below four, even though four is the most common type of vehicle. But because you've gotten the average... Or even, like, uh, you can't really tell what that vehicle would look like. Like, what vehicle has 3.8 wheels? That doesn't make sense. You can't work with that because that isn't real. You have built something from the numbers that does not exist. And uh, because of that, we need filtering. And, by the way, the answer is not just use a median. Because if you got the median number of wheels, you just get four and annihilate the existence of motorcycles. Which, as you can tell from how loud they are when they drive past here, they very much exist. Um, and yeah, so from here, we have the uh, overall retention, like we, we have different ways to split stuff. This is actually an old uh, query I made in this link called KQL in PlayFab. We're not going to be using PlayFab too much because I think Power BI does everything it does better, except for data storage. And, uh, but yeah, this is, a, this is an example where if you look at, say, the um, touch versus keyboard, if you were to average out the touch and keyboard audiences, you would get a certain session length of 249 seconds. But then, when in reality, keyboard users are playing for almost an entire two minutes longer, whereas touch users play about 30 seconds shorter. So really, there are two categories here. A keyboard group, which is having a, a pretty great time in terms of playing through a, in a single play session, but then touch users who are having a bad time and if I hadn't filtered through these audiences, I wouldn't have known that. I wouldn't be able to figure out that this state 
Because state, at the end of the day, state only makes sense on an individual level. Whenever we combine states together, average them out, we are making something that isn't real but could be close to reality. That's a key thing to remember. Like you, and you have to watch out for those hidden influencers. Um, but yeah, so for now, just know filtering and splitting up the data set into smaller and smaller groups, that could be helpful. However, it comes with a big asterisk. And it's probably one of the worst things about uh, analytics. The reason that analytics is not something everyone does, the biggest reason I've seen cited against it, is it's expensive. In order to really get the most out of analytics, you need a lot of users. If you don't have a way to advertise your game, if you don't have a way to get people in there, you cannot get enough users to have a reliably low error margin. Like, look at this. Here is the 100 is the uh, 100 uh, trials in rolling a die. And you can see the average, uh, the, 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 I, the theoretical average for rolling a die will get you a 3.5. Once again, average does not provide you with reality. But in the reality itself, there's errors. There's skewing from the predicted. And because of that, you have a uh, kind of an issue. If you only roll it once, there's only a, for one, there's a zero chance that you'll get, with just one zero, there's a zero chance you'll get 3.5, but even twice, you could skew all the way up uh, to like 5 point, like what would it, what would it be, a, if you got a 6 in 1, and then a, like a, I guess a 4 or a 5 in the other, you get a 5.5, and that actually shows it there, that's a 5.5. That's the biggest skew you can get, which is almost like an 80% margin of error. That's horrible, and that's what you, happens when you use a single, uh, single testing data. Like, by all means, it's 100% accurate to what happened that specific time, but you cannot apply what happened there across everyone. And so, yeah, you need at least a few hundred in the sample size area. Um, like, from there, you uh, can see it a little bit illustrated here. You can, like, you may think, oh, it's okay. I'll just use, uh, I'll just have a thousand players that. But that's only ten. That's only about a five to ten k in advertising. Um, like that's that, that I, I can afford that. That's uh, yeah. Like uh, what t t fifteen bucks worth of robux can get you into here. That that's enough for success. Uh, and the issue from that though is the filtering from before. Look at notice this. Look at this. Retain true. Eight thousand eight hundred out of the eighty nine hundred. Retain false, just over 100. That is a massive disparity. Like, uh, and even worse, like, I don't remember what game this was to have such a massive difference in, in like, retention length. Okay. Uh, like, uh, maybe I just swapped the labels or something. Uh, this is a pretty old photo. Anyway, I'm not teaching you guys how to use this tool because it's messy. Uh, the... But like if you look, keyboard versus touch for, is another example where only about a fifth of the audience is using keyboards, yet it seems to be the better audience. And that, you can see it here. Here's a random uh, pie chart I got from a website linked here. But right, right here, with a population of 3000 which is what you can get from a good, good $20, $30 in advertisement spending, like not, like if you don't currently have much money, but you have the time to make a game, you have the time to earn 20 to $30. Like, that's the thing. People always tell me, ah, oh, it's too expensive, I can't do this. Like, either it's, it, it might be too expensive for you. But that too expensive for you part comes from you having the time to make a game. If you have the time to make a game, you have the time to earn enough to advertise with. I do not accept that as an excuse. Um, if you have the internet, you, okay, yeah, I, I harped on that long enough. Okay, point is, you have this group of 3,000 people. That's assuming, this is assuming an even distribution, which as we just saw here with retention being a huge, uh, like PC versus touch skewing wildly in the favor of touch, uh, which is true in real life, typically. Uh, this is just more for simplification. Because even with a simplified system, it still gets really bad really quickly. So we split it once into three groups. Okay, uh, like if we check, if we do a filter and see just how domain expertise people use it. Okay, that, uh, that does this. 
Okay, what about people with just programming skills? Okay, they perform this way. What about people with just math skills? Oh, they perform this way. Okay, now from there, overlap again. Uh, 350. That's, that's 350. Now, remember that this part? 350 users, that's, uh, that's not the best margin of error. Like, it's workable. Like, it's about 7%. Um, but we'll see in a bit that the error margin really can matter uh, at times. So we'll, like, uh, and then from there, what do you think of this data scientist? What do you think is going to happen there? 100. That's 100 users, a 15% error margin. Yeah, and so now let's swap these out with real life game terms. We're like someone returning, a person who uses mobile, and a person who completed an event in your game. These are three different groups. And there are only, uh, and like, think, like you can imagine how a returning user who completed a certain event could, how that could dramatically skew which paths they take. Because there are so many variables there, so many things about, uh, about their situation which could influence it. But like for a population of 3,000, that audience with a very important demographic that makes up a lot of people can only really be represented with something that's like 3% the, uh, audience size. Am I doing that right? Is it, yeah, it's 3%. Oh. Yeah, and with that 15, like maybe you can think, oh, well, 15% error margin, that's not bad. We, we can work with that. I've, I've had 15% error margins on exams. Like, uh, it's fine. Um, yeah, and for that, we're going to have to, uh, well, I guess, before we get to move on to the next part, let's just focus on the reality of this. If a... Uh, like, um, if you have, say, a retention rate of, let's just say 10%, and that retention rate needs to get to 12% to get those discovery players that I was telling you about, or even just that you change something. Like, let's say you make an update, and your 10% and your 10%, uh, and your 10 retention rate increases to 11.5%. Tell me, did that happen because you tested and improved the game and the thing you did, you did made the game better? You literally cannot tell me with this error margin. You cannot tell. You, it could very just as easily be this error margin. Like the, 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 You could have just gotten unlucky, rolling a bad die, and had that result show up as fake. Like, like, it basically mislead you, trick you into treating your game differently. And who knows, maybe you, you might, what's even worse is you might even have sacrificed other metrics to get that gain, but because of the error margin, that gain isn't real, or it might not be. So with the higher your margin of error is, the more dramatic the change needs to be. And with stuff, especially with, with like retention and session duration, where a, a change could have a very minor effect, you need to be able to track this stuff. And, you, and the more, and like analytics is hard enough when you have a lot of data. When you have not much data, it's way harder. And so yeah, the more people you can run through your model, the better. Uh, and that's what makes analytics expensive. That's, what is, that's the big barrier because every time you want to run a test or, or like run people through the game, you need at least 30 bucks usually. Like if your game isn't already successful, you need to pay for those new players. Like, if you aren't getting free discovery players, that'll cost you. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's rough. <laughs> I, I don't recommend uh, uh, trying, uh, trying to make all this work with just 100 players or 50 players. Because you would, the, the error margin would be ridiculous. You would not, you would most likely mislead yourself rather than learn anything. Do not mess with small numbers in these. I don't know... I, this is me begging you. But yeah. So, now we're going to get to visualization. And because, uh, and, and this is the Power BI stuff. To people who stuck around this long hoping I'd talk about it. Don't worry. We're talking about it now. Um, yeah. So it's, it's very, uh, it's very important. But yeah. The, uh, so, but once you've gotten your data 
organized. Like you understand why you need your data to be formatted in a certain way and the strategies you need to succeed. Well, Power BI takes all of the things we need to do and makes it a reality. Um, in fact, I believe BI, isn't that like a business insight or business intelligence? Like pretty much this is something that is used across industries. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. And I hope you guys love it as much as I do. So what you need, um, you need a way to store data. Power BI does not store data for you. It is not like a Google Analytics or PlayFab. Uh, you need to find a way to store data and then send that data to it, which sending the data is pretty easy usually. Um, but storing it, there are some options you have to consider. Um, you need a custom domain email. This is a bit of an odd requirement. I, it's the only time I've ever seen it happen, but Power BI is very much a business thing. And because of that, they assumed at some point that casual Gmail users like wouldn't be using it. I, I don't know. Maybe there's like a bot problem. But in order to uh, access and download Power BI, uh, let's see, a data studio? I know that there are other competitors to Power BI. In fact, I probably should point that out now. Uh, Tableau is probably the biggest Power BI thing, which can really go head to head. It's just a lot more expensive. Uh, and I'd say it's probably better, but it's like three, it's like hundreds of a month it's expensive. Um, I have, so you might have found a better solution. I don't know about Data Studio, um, but I mean, you, you want, how about this? You take a watch at uh, how Power BI runs and see, see, how, see what it looks like and the things you can do with it. And then you tell me, is Data Studio better? Because who knows, maybe that's my next presentation. Um, but yeah, so uh, you need a custom domain email, which means you have to pay up to two to three bucks a month, and now you can have at custom domain name after your email. Uh, I use, I've, I've, I happen to have already owned it for my uh, own business, Night, Night Cycle Studios, at Night Cycle. Um, so it's fun, it doesn't cost too much. It is technically a barrier to entry, but like, once again, the cost to market a game is so much more. I, I really think it is worth it. And also, I mean, you're, if you want to be a professional game developer, you're going to need to get a custom email at some point. You can't just keep doing business with a, with a Gmail account. Um, let's see, the one gigabyte of RAM, 1.4 gigahertz processor. You can feel free to check that stuff, but uh, um, I mean, you can check that stuff directly or you can just download it and try it and see how it goes. You probably are above this. This is the minimum. Uh, and it needs to run on Windows. I'm so sorry to anyone here who uh, uses a Mac in general, not even just for this. Feel bad for you. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, no, it is a Windows thing. Um, yeah, and that sucks. I, I would I would have loved to have it be cross-platform because I know Roblox development is cross-platform. And there are arguments, especially for certain artist roles to... Uh, have uh, win Windows and also people who I, some of the most data dr driven in intelligent programmers I know uh, use like a, like a Linux and all that stuff um, but they're also probably smart enough to like run a Windows emulator but still it is Windows restricted uh, I mean it's owned by Microsoft they didn't make it but they bought it you know those monopolies uh, and yeah so this is the analytics workflow. This is the entire process from something happening in your game to you knowing what happened all the way on the other end. Uh, yeah, and I guess just start with stuff that's happening in the game. This one's easy. I mean, comparably. Here are the stuff you need to track. I think we're having a motorcycle race outside. I have no other way to explain that noise. Um, you have the timestamp when the event happened. Now, I would say that this is less important in terms of like knowing at what point in human history this event happened and more in terms of just organizing the event order like I've I, uh, I have a few games that run entirely off of, uh, of the uh, in-game like player duration like basically how many how long since the player entered the game that's my timestamp for most of those with the exception being when they first enter it I include the like the, uh, the, the timestamp for that because certain days of the week or times of the year might have different performance. So you do want to track it somewhere, but not every event needs it. Because functionally, what timestamp means most of the time is 
what point in the player's play experience did this happen? What point in their journey? Server ID, this is this can be useful for free, for when uh, you really get, like, this is more like a pro level thing, but if you really get to the point of optimizing the individual experience, you'll want to start optimizing the server level experience, like figuring out what types of players play well together, what types of interactions happen between them that makes that 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 uh, require player states. Um, we're not going to go too much into that, but I track server ID. Um, and as a bonus, if a player exits and then returns a few seconds later in the same server, you can assume they just disconnected uh, and just continue their session from there. It's a little bit hacky, but I mean, eh, just have that be a custom event. And I think you should still be able to maintain integrity. Uh, so the event state, the event state, we, we just did a lot of talking about the event state. It's all that information. I use, I just send a table through the events, honestly. A JSON wrapped table. Uh, user ID, send that. Play session ID, um, that's the thing you generate that helps track this kind of stuff. Uh, remember, uh, HTTP service uh, get GUID. I believe that's the, that's the exact way to get a unique player session identifier. Um, and then player state, same thing as the event state. Uh, this is actually a little bit dated because now I've started blending. Like the event state is sort of the uh, is the stuff unique to the event, and the player state is uh, the stuff unique to the player. I've moved a little bit away from describing them as event and player states, and more uh, just state and uh, like event, like decision configuration. I, I don't know. Labeling it doesn't isn't the important part here. Point is, you get all that important data in an event. A uh, single table, which you then wrap in a JSON, uh, a, a J that another HTTP uh, call you can make, which converts a table into text essentially, and then you can send that text through the HTTP service, uh, and the HTTP service uh, allows you to connect with the wider internet, uh, including various uh, storage solutions, which brings us to um, the uh, get where where to put that in-game data. Uh, why did, did I just change the color and not the name? Dang it. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, so you have the uh, actual storage things. I'm just going to give you five. There are better, there are more options, and there might even be better options. These are the ones that I have interacted with in some way or another, uh, in the sense that I've attempted them. Uh, some of them, I, I, I've gotten it to work for two of these. Um, but yeah, so... Google Analytics is good. It has, uh, it's free, kind of. After a certain uh, point where you're like using up too much of their system, they'll start saying either you pay us like $150,000 or we cut off your service. And like, realistically, just like, and it's per month. So like, just track how much data you're using. If you're troubleshooting a, a new game from scratch, you'll be fine. Uh, most likely. But if your game's already successful and you just want to improve it an existing game, Google Analytics might not be for you. Uh, though you can always do like some basic filtering where like you only include every other play session to keep under that, but that's a bit unnecessary in my opinion. Uh, especially since you, you want as much data as you can. Like heck, Google allows you to use this service for free to gather data on you. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so fairly limited capacity. Uh, UI, the, the, the UI for that site's kind of weird. I don't know how else to explain it. It's just kind of a confusing mess. But you really don't have to be on it for too long. You just have to like get a key from it once. And then you can just, once you've set it up, you don't ever have to open it again. Um, Firebase, uh, this is another sort of solution. I haven't used it. There's a guide for it. Um, it in AWS, um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, so, You'd have to check that out. It it does cost you per usage though, um, but it's like cents per per megabyte, so not much. Like it's gonna be like a few dollars a month for you, most likely, in most situations. Uh, AWS, which is Amazon's company, uh, Amazon Web Services, where basically because Amazon ha ha owns enough servers to handle high capacity days, they have a lot of leftover server space that they don't use all the time. Uh, and because of that, they rent those servers out through the AWS system. And because of that, um, it has this interesting quirk. It's pretty similar to Firebase, 
Uh, there aren't any tutorials for it on Roblox, as far as I can tell, but uh, it is the industry standard. But it fails on Prime Day because that's when they need those servers again, and you'll lose connections, and uh, that's won't matter most of the time. But I, I mean, it's a weird enough thing to point out, I guess. A uh, custom server that means just like set up a server, like uh, host a server on your actual computer, um, or buy a designated computer for it. It's free, and I mean you have to set it up, and some uh, database tools cost money, but like you can set it up for free. You can store money, uh, not store money, well, kind of. You can store, uh, you can store data on your server for free without paying anyone else a dime, and have, and uh, the only limits are how much memory your computer has. And I tell you, like, most computers these days reach like a terabyte in storage. That's more than enough data um, for ninety-nine percent of what you're going to do. Uh, it's also faster. I mean, duh. <laughs> Like you don't have to talk to the internet; it's just there already. Power BI can reference it directly if it's if it's on your computer. Um, cons: it's easily the most difficult thing to do. You have to know PHP to some extent, as far as I can tell. Uh, and when your computer is down, slash Wi-Fi is down, you don't get to record events. Um, yeah, so I mean that's that. It doesn't use too much data unless your game's massive, like Adopt Me scale, uh, because you're setting pretty small events. But uh, you know, if it's down, it's down, and you'll lose that data. And imagine you do a play test, and then your power goes out. Uh, oh yeah, no, Heroku. I, I almost added that as a, a Heroku. I put under Firebase in terms of com, uh, com, comparability. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely, there there are. Just look up like storage in, in the dev forum, and you'll find these. Um, but yeah, no. And, and if the power, but like if the power goes out or your internet service provider goes down because they're monopolies that don't care about you. Um, then yeah, the custom server will be a bad move. And I'm not even sure if I should recommend it, but there's something tempting about never having to pay anyone for server storage. Uh, and then PlayFab. PlayFab is provided for free. There's a free trial, kind of like Google Analytics. Honestly, PlayFab is Google Analytics with more built-in. Uh, it also has a slightly better UI. But you need new, but like to get the most out of it, you need to know KQL. Anyone who's, who's ever used SQL is fine. Like you, KQL is just SQL, except it's read-only. Um, but if you don't know KQL, it's going to take you a day. Like maybe you, you can probably, uh, maybe in an hour or two, you can get it to run to the point where like, uh, or just copy someone else's query in a few minutes. You can get to just export all the data. But that's still a learning curve. Um, I'd say for people who don't want to learn KQL and are not comfortable with coding too much, uh, Google Analytics, that's what you go with. Everyone else, play fab. Everyone who's good at PHP, or wants to go through a more technical tutorial, uh, other outside servers. And yeah, so that's uh, gathering the data. Yeah, the uh, finally Power BI, the part you have all been waiting for, and I hope uh, I hope you enjoy it because this stuff's crazy. So Power BI, uh, it's I've, I've made it its own little table here right now because there's a lot to it, but it's a lot, but it's also easy to learn. It's like Minecraft. The, the concepts are simple enough to catch on to, but it could take you a long time to actually see everything. Uh, yeah, so, but honestly, I wouldn't put it as too much more difficult than, say, Excel. It really is Excel. I mean, it, actually, it literally is Excel in many ways. Uh, it's owned by Microsoft, and they, they use a lot of the same tools. Uh, but yeah, so, first step, Power BI. Uh, you take all the data and then you get it through something called a query, and that sounds scary. I know it's okay. It's not. It's not scary. You don't have to be scared. You don't even have to code. This is how you query in Power BI. You press Get Data. You choose the data. In your case, if you're using any of the outside servers like uh, Google Analytics or PlayFab, uh, you might be doing web-based. And actually, that reminds me, PlayFab. For some reason, you can't set up an auto query. You can download your data as a CSV file which is what I do, but you can't get it to auto-update uh, unless you use the full version and are smarter than me, which is still a lot of people, but like I can't recommend it. I can only recommend things that I was able to accomplish. Um, yeah, so from there, I like you, like in my case, text CSV. So import a text CSV, otherwise follow the specific instructions for whatever service you use for data storage. They 
it is such a comprehensive list of data storage options. It is, you are going to be fine. Once you've got that, uh, the, the, once you have that data set up, it'll actually query its first load into the, into the Power BI. And from there, you actually get to edit the query uh, through transforming the data. And you could technically do this, start with the transform the data part, then add the data, but I don't know. I think it's easier to have the data visible and then transform it. And yeah, this is the Power Query Editor. It opens up a new window. Uh, that's, that confused me at first. Power, like it opens up a full new window. That is a, it's a full screen window for something called the Power Query Editor. Um, so yeah, so if you feel like you can't find something and I've referenced it, you don't see it on the screen, check to make sure you aren't accidentally looking at the Power Query Editor instead of Power BI. Uh, yeah, just saving you some time, hopefully. But yeah, so the Power Query Editor is pretty much just Excel, except with one key difference. Has anyone here ever <clears throat> uh, cleaned up data in Excel before? Like you get a lot of raw data, you gotta like format it, you gotta change things, you gotta clean up stuff that's, that uh, isn't, that like that's, that's uh, null, you gotta um, reorganize the columns, you gotta create new columns and uh, all this stuff. You know, that, you know that step? Super boring. And you have to do it every time you get new data. Except for Power BI, because Power BI tracks what you do. It tracks the exact steps. And it's really, it's, like, it's just, it's Excel, except instead of manual, doing a bunch of manual labor every time, you do it once, and then it automates it for you. It is beautiful. Like, it is just amazing. I, someone who had to clean up data in Excel for years, and heck, even in, uh, to some extent in uh, KQL with PlayFab, like, this is so elegant. Because KQL can do all this stuff, but you have to learn a coding language and then look up the syntax. And KQL is kind of mean, honestly. It has, it'll mess you up in a lot of ways. But this is, it's literally just Excel. Just Excel and you change stuff. And, and it tracks your changes. And you know what, it's, it's Excel with time travel. You know, who has used Google Sheets and gone back into the history of it to uh, to like change something to like see a previous version. It's got version control built in because it's only just a timeline of your of what you've done. And if you select something, it'll show you what the data looks like at that point. And you can add steps and you can go back in time, undo mistakes. There is like no technical debt here. <laughs> I mean, there's some, but like still, it's like, oh, it is beautiful. Chef's kiss it is, yeah. Um, yeah, and then from there. You can split the initial query into different tables. Uh, the key things here are duplicate and reference. Duplicating a table basically just requeries it from scratch, kind of, with, but then applies the steps you've already applied. So that means if you go back in time and add a new step here, it won't be added onto the table you duplicate. However, if you use a reference, which is faster, it'll just solve that table first to the point of reference and then branch out from there and allow you to make changes from that. References are a lot more performant than duplication, but they don't always work for everything. If you plan on uh, changing something in the back which would invalidate a further step, uh, that's when you use duplicate. But I haven't had to do that too often, so reference is just my go-to. Um, after that, you go, so now after you've done this, you have now edited your data, clean it up in whatever way you like. Uh, honestly, you don't need to do too much here. Uh, like I, most of the stuff I've done here, is just unpacking the data. Like it's renaming, removing columns. Uh, one cool thing that Power BI do, the Query Editor does is it can automatically unpack uh, JSON tables into columns. So if you have a bunch of state, it'll unpack those into columns for you to whatever level you like, or not. Like you can even keep them packed into a JSON and read directly from that JSON if you really want to. I don't think you necessarily should, but at the same time, because I unpack it all, all the time, my... Uh, my, uh, my query editor, is like my data tables just have so many columns. But you'll learn quickly that column, you don't mess around with the columns too much because even though this part's a lot like Excel, be in this part a lot. You're going to be in this part at the beginning. Uh, like you're gonna, this is the setup phase. Once you get this set up, like that's the thing, you don't have to do it again. I've gone, like for certain games, I've gone uh, like multiple sessions without ever having to open this up. Like to the point where like I open it up so irregularly that I'll like stack things I need to do in it. Like like I'll make a list of things to do next time I open it. Because there's like a 20 second 
like a delay in total opening and closing it. And that 20 seconds performed so irregularly. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so that's the query. That's how you get the data into Power BI. It is amazing. And uh, yeah, but from there, you can create new tables uh, filtered accordingly. Um, and then from there, really, you only need three tables. Here I have five, but that's my own that that's my own game. I wouldn't say apply tiers unless you really think you need to check server events or are really tight on data storage and want to s store certain globally experienced events as server events rather than individual events sent time and time again, which might be the case in some in some instances. But uh, no. So instead, close power, close the query editor. Go back to Power BI. There, from the home page, you will see a little thing that looks like this. This is the relationships tab. It'll show you your tables as these little like uh, these little blobs, these little blocks, and you can connect the columns. Like if you have user IDs in the player session states, you can connect them to user IDs in the user table. If a session ID, ha if, a, if a player event has a certain session ID attached, you can connect it to the session ID of the player session. And so you can, you, you can, you can connect all these uh, unique tables and describe when they are related to each other. And you can have various options. There's uh, many to one, which is uh, where a lot of different things from one table call to a single, to a single, and a single row in another table. Uh, there's also many to many, which is when many events call, uh, call to many um, events elsewhere. It's not nearly as useful, but can be used in some summation things. And then one to one, which is like the gold standard where it's just one, one row in one place corresponds directly with one row in another place. Uh, but typically, you would do many to one, uh, and one like uh, the most often. Um, yeah, and active relationships, uh, to mention, active relationships are pretty much, you can only have one per, for, per link between tables. But when a relationship is active, it is the go-to table. It is like the go-to connection for comparing stuff between tables. Like we'll see later on, like if I, I like uh, when we're solving for KPIs, we're solving for them on the player level. So if we want to know that a certain event is more likely to influence a certain KPI on a user level, it'll use the active connection that is the serve the player's uh, user ID or or session ID to connect itself to the data we've stored directly related to that player or that user and work from there. And so active relationships are very powerful and uh, allow you to automate a lot of stuff. And from there, let's actually talk about the visualization because uh, that's, that's the important part. Uh, well, kind of. We're, KPIs, I guess, are the next part. I got ahead of myself. So if you look at the KPIs, you have the... Uh, um, what's it called? You have these metrics, these uh, these two different ways to get new information. Like in in Excel, you'll make a new column every time, and you can do that here because you know it's Excel. Um, but there's also something called measure. So if an Excel is something, if you think of Excel as like it's very uh, it's very relative to where a cell is located. A cell will reference other specific cells and solve instantaneously when that other cell changes. Um, yeah, it, it's predefined. It's not super flexible, but it's rigid and, 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 uh, and strong in, in that sense. Uh, and in Power BI, it's pretty much the same. They're slower. They can reference other cells. Um, but they also are only solved at the beginning. Whenever the data is refreshed, it solves all the columns. And it does that once. And it's slow. The, the more columns you use, I've had to use a few columns because I don't plan things out all the time. Um, in fact, this is another reason that you might want to include unnecessary hit, uh, um, historical data in the, in, the, in the event state. Because almost, you almost always to, act, to solve for historical data, um, specifically in the past, not just not the past and the future, you will need to use a column. And that can, once you have like 20 of those, that can be pretty, uh, that can slow stuff down a lot. 
Um, but no, and the measures, measures are the opposite. Super lightweight. They are just, they, they're the equivalent of a function or like a utility. Like you just, in, you have inputs and you have outputs. And um, like you run a row through a measure and then you output the, uh, and then you output the, the, a certain result. Like, and that row includes any related rows. So if you have a, you have a, if you have a, uh, what's it called? Many to one or one to one relationship with anything, that row basically glues on the row of that other table. So you can access, like you can check up an event. You can look at an event and see like, say uh, the flamethrower example from earlier. That flamethrower, how much damage did they do? Okay, we can see that. And how long were they in the game? It'll, it can use those relationships to solve for that. And then the cool thing about a measure is it has a dynamic data set. So that means based on the events you feed it, you'll get different answers. So if you want to see just how mobile users are doing, like you'll use a measure because then you can put in, send just mobile users through that measure and solve for just them. And this flexibility that comes with measures is what makes Power BI amazing. And with, without much further ado, like I guess, yeah, the, we're all, this is the last slide, but then we get to the visualizations because what this is, is this shows how I set up KPIs. So in a player session, I will, I will include stuff that is important for that session. Basically, the stuff you need to solve for the KPIs. You'll have stuff like how much did they spend, how long did they, how long uh, of a duration were they there for, um, days after first visit, some pretty basic stuff. But then I sum it all up and average it, uh, depending on the metric, to provide the KPI. And in fact, the user table is almost entirely just measures and columns. And uh, because, uh, so you, you'll notice that the col that, uh, this, this has columns and measures where, uh, for example, the total revenue for a single user, that is solved as a column. That's what that symbol means. But the average revenue per user, that is solved as a measure so that we can define that based on what users we've selected. If that, it'll take all the total revenues and average them out, and you can get an average revenue per user. And that, that's, this is how I combine uh, Power BI, like how, how I uh, get KPIs easily accessible and flexible in a way that works really well with Power BI. And that is because of the next thing, visualizations. The part everyone's excited about. The part which got half the people here and they didn't even stick around. I don't blame them, though. This stuff, uh, it's a long presentation. We're almost at the three-hour mark. And uh, yeah, I, we were supposed to have ended three minutes ago. I'm hungry. My voice is disappearing. Um, I, I ran out of water. But yeah, uh, so now, if before we were messing around here to do Excel stuff, now we're messing around here. Uh, this is the visualization page. This is the dashboard, I believe is the specific phrasing. And it looks a bit, um, it looks a bit complicated. And I mean, it has things you need to do, but I feel like this page is overwhelming. When really, it, it should it doesn't need to be. If you look at, they're really, on this page, I'm showing you maybe eight pieces of information, eight concepts. The first one is just showing you which visual I'm explaining. I'm showing you this basic frames per second histogram. It's not that complicated. It's, uh, for, it's, it's, it's showing how different uh, user groups, how many, how many different events were happening at different frames per second. And uh, from there, yeah, I can see the, uh, um, yeah, and like what makes Power BI so powerful is the sort of dynamic stuff that is possible here. So first, let's just talk about setting up the initial graph. Uh, okay, we're, so we've set up the, uh, pop, we've set up this, 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 bar chart or histogram. I don't remember. I think it's a bar chart. I think. I don't remember. Um, anyway, it's this one in the Power BI console for anyone who's following along. Uh, the, then you include the frames per second uh, from the event data and then you include a measure I made call, uh, called population which uh, pretty much just counts how many uh, people have a certain FPS below a certain level, uh, and uh, 
Actually, no, wait, no, it, it include. it's a measure that just counts, uh, I, 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 actually, wait, okay, it is literally just a count measure, I've relabeled it to show up as population in the graph. It, yeah, that's the thing, you can relabel these data things to make them a little bit more nice visualization-wise. Like, your, your data can say, like, have a bunch of underscores in coding format, uh, but, then that, but then you can translate it into, like, normal language uh, at this stage. Just cl click that down arrow. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, then I just drag, literally, like, there's just a list of variables, like, right here. I literally just drag them over into here, and I'm done. It's now showing me the data. That's, it's, it's that easy. From there, if I want to, like, remove all the people who are speed hacking, um, I can take out, I can filter it to just less than 61, <coughs> which uh, the filter page is right here, and you can apply filters on either a specific visual a specific page, as you notice from here, similar to Excel, uh, this game has a very specific, uh, the Power BI can show you different pages of dashboards for organization, because you'll see pretty quickly dashboards can feel, can get, can get packed. Um, and you can have it uh, filter be on just a certain page, uh, or even across all pages if you want to. Um, yeah, so from there, you have these filters. But, don't just filter out for specific audiences. For that, you'll be using something called a slicer. Now slicers are where measures true power show because with the slicer, you can filter out very specific data for events and for players. Like for this one, if I were to select, uh, show me the boss, like show me how boss player FPS changes, I can click that and it will, and it will do that. And then every literal visual on the page will update to show just the boss. Like literally, it, it, it's like, it'll be like if I'd started from scratch and only gone with boss data. And it does it instantly. I can do that for spectators, I can do that for survivors. Let's say I want to see only people who are returning visited. I can, use, I can take this slider. These are both slicers right here. And I can increase it a bit. And then it'll see how this changes. It is amazingly powerful. It is one of the most useful tools. And it will change how you get to work with your data. And it will show you the, in the hidden relationships and show you the types of people who are having different experiences, the, the true influencers for these things. But if that still sounds a bit uh, overwhelming, trust me, you, you're in for a treat in a bit. Um, but yeah, so you have, uh, so you have these things called slicers. Um, from there, you can also have you. In, in terms of the values area, you can also summarize, uh, su summarize the different. Uh, you can summarize in some pre-built ways, or just create a custom measure. Uh, there are custom measures, and there are also quick measures. Uh, from uh, th there's no major difference, I, I guess, uh, in terms of functionality, but. Uh, the, the quick measures, if I remember correctly, are like, there's like UI, like it's a, it's a form you fill out rather than coding language because um, all their, Power, Power BI gets the best of both worlds in the sense that it has a lot of user interface stuff to help you interact with it, but it never removes your access to the actual coding. You can, there, the language is used in Power BI. There's one called DAX, which is used for measures, and one called M, which is used for queries. You can learn them and probably get some really powerful stuff going if you learn them. But the box version of it works for a lot of stuff. And really, you don't need to be a genius programmer. It's like Excel level coding most of the time. Uh, in fact, uh, DAX is very similar to Excel. Uh, M is a little, bit, it's a little bit closer to KQL because it's a querying language. Uh, but still, it's not that difficult. And finally, uh, this one isn't necessary, but it's a recommendation. Make sure your KPIs are, vis are visible at all times, even if you're not necessarily solving for a certain one at a certain point. Don't, like, you want to be able to see them because these are the life stats of your game. Like, imagine you're a doctor and the, and the patient has, like, high blood pressure. Um, and so you track their blood pressure and give them, and, uh, and, like, you're, and, uh, then you look, you try a very, few various options and you learn that um, the best way to lower their blood pressure is to decapitate them. 
you can imagine why that might have some unintended consequences. And if they had been tracking the heart rate as well, they would have realized that decapitating your patient is not, in fact, the best solution to the problem in improving the patient's health. Same with your game. You do not want to accidentally screw up another KPI in the pursuit of, a, of, of increasing a certain one. Okay? So always have your KPIs visible. You don't necessarily need to be in text format. Like, I think retention rate especially could, have, could be uh, beneficial at, through various different metrics. Or sorry, various different visualizations. Uh, but yeah, so let's uh, let's actually show some some cool uh, stuff beyond that. Like uh, this is the overall workflow, though. That's how it goes. Let's talk about some individual visualizations, which I'm sure you guys are interested in. This is called a Sankey chart. Super useful for path tracking. In fact, each one of these paths, you can select a path, and it'll do the same slicer filtering from before. Almost all these visuals, including these columns. If you select a part of the visual, it will auto-apply that filter onto everything else. And it is so great. Oh my goodness, I cannot express how awesome it is. And yeah, it's just, it's so flexible. Like you, it, 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 I, I, yeah, I, I could go on and on. So yeah, this is a Sankey chart. It tracks, uh, I've, you can have it track uh, progression through a system. Um, it's a bit of a headache to set up in some ways because either you should track event index indexes um, in in your game, which you can do, or you need to set it up in column, which re, which involves not, a, not necessarily difficult, but some heavier uh, DAX usage, that one language. Um, so yeah, either track it in game or, yeah, all right, yeah, no, see you, okay. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, uh, how about RDC? Well, we should definitely reconnect then, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, let's see. Actually, no, uh, DM me. <laughs> yeah, no, that, the RDC, it feels close, but it's still very far away. Not nearly as far away as that fire truck, though. Yeah, but no, thank, thank you for stopping by. Um, yeah, so, this stuff's amazing. Um, yeah, the, uh, Sankey charts. Include the indexes or get good at DAX. Both are probably good strategies. Um, once you once you have those, just uh, include the labels. You you might also want to build in some deduplica uh, deduplication, like oh, basically only uh, like have a. I, I I've labeled something called a series, where if you have a series of events in a row, like track that in the column, and then uh, use a, then then just have a. Then instead of having showing progress through unique events, show progress through series. Um, for example, this specific visual is uh, player series. So like if they chat multiple times in a row, it only shows up once. It only changes to the next thing when they do something else. Uh, and ar arguably, you might even want to filter out stuff more from there. The dream is to find a way to do this in a way that allows for measures, because right now you can't filter out certain types of events uh, because it solves the columns at the beginning, so it'll just end a path once you go to that event. Um, so yeah. But no, that's a Sankey chart. Very useful for, for tracking uh, paths through a game. Um, possibly the most useful. Um, but yeah, from there, heat maps. I, uh, I got a little bit of praise from this one. When It's so stupid. I'm, I'm so sorry, guys. This one's, this one, you're gonna hate this one. That's a scatter plot. You could have done this in like Google Sheets this entire time. It's a scatter plot. It's a scatter plot with set with filtered to have the dimensions of the map. Like I basically see in that map up up in the upper right hand corner, there's a picture of the map that a literal screenshot that ended up being the background. Um, I the red dot and the blue dot each represent like plus a thousand, like like one thousand, one thousand, and then negative one thousand, negative one thousand in the game world. So like I have a comparison point. And then from there, I just used using uh, this software called GIMP. I just flattened it out. I I I I, I saw I uh, filtered I I uh, changed it so that the perspective wasn't auto filtering, and uh, got sort of this flat top down version of it, which happened to be the exact shape, which then I could I could then constrain the image to only show like to the center of these circles and out. And yeah, like from there you get this image. 
And yeah, that's it. Like the thing is, just like with this data, it re this all of these dots respond to uh, measures and filters and heck, you can even select a specific dot to see what events happening there. Uh, you'll notice uh, most of this red over here. These are death events from players jumping off um, the edge of the lobby because apparently the lobby is so boring that they have no better thing to do than to literally kill themselves. Um, so yeah, kind of insights you get from data visualization. Um, you'll also be interested to know that apparently a lot of lit players were getting angry and leaving because they thought they could somehow get down from this ledge, and when they kept dying, they exited out of anger. And you can see that in part from the word cloud, because this word cloud, uh, it shows what people are talking about. Now, this specific word cloud only shows chat events. Um, it's really easy. It's a, it's a, it's a, you can just, it's a plugin for Power BI. I believe you can download plugins for free, or at least for the free trial of the, of the full version, and the full version only costs like 10 bucks. It's worth it. Please buy it. Um, yeah, and from there, uh, you, you just download the plugin. takes one minute, if that, maybe 30 seconds. Once it's in, add the message content column. Um, now it'll filter to show whenever, whenever you have a certain like type of player, it'll show what kind of things they're talking about at certain points in their play sessions. And like you can do a bunch of cool filtering to figure out what people are talking about at certain points in their gameplay. Um, if you want to go farther with it, you can also include a column that shows what they say next. Like find the next time they chat after an event and then like, or what they say in the next minute or next 10 seconds, you know, like what they say in response to, what's just, to what just happened. And that's probably the golden standard for this kind of stuff. Um, and it's probably pretty easy to implement. I just didn't have time for this. Uh, because I implemented it this way without realizing that it would only be restricted to chat events. But still, like, yeah, you can see there are a lot of good ways to handle this. And you will occasionally get some funny moments. Like, uh, <laughs> like at one point, like when someone in the game, uh, the game is called uh, Shadow, like, not Shadow of Colossus, that's a different game. Um, Colossus Valley. Uh, the intro of Colossus Valley, where you become this giant psychic, like, telekinetic monster. You can pick up things and throw them across the uh, map and like it's just wreak havoc while everyone else flees from you. Fun game. Uh, imagine like uh, that one uh, shark bite game for um, on land. But yeah, apparently when people were selected to be a colossus, their chances of saying God go up like a million percent. Um, if someone has asked, is this even legal? It's legal to track message content. Um, I think, like, uh, in terms of uh, ethical, I think, in my own opinion, it's fine so long as you aren't tracking down individual users. Because uh, that, as you can see here, there's, it's pretty, uh, like, this is across 2,000 users. Each one of these uh, uh, words was said by multiple people, and it's taken out of multiple different sentences. Um, and... Like, yeah, it's, it's legal, though. Like, Roblox records chats as well. How do you think they handle reports? Like, uh, it's, yeah, I think it's up to the developers individually to be ethical, unfortunately. I, uh, like, there are many ways to be an unethical developer before you get word clouds involved. I think there are a lot more opportunities to use this tool to help yourself get context of what's happening, what people are talking about, at a certain point in the game to help improve the game. I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's like a power saw or something. Like, it's, it can be dangerous if you misuse it, yeah, but we still kind of need them for certain jobs. And I think this has a very specific purpose, and that's to essentially get a very high-level view of what your user feedback is. And, in fact, it's not even that uncommon in the industry. Uh, like, did you know, uh, what's it called? Um, no Man's Sky, a game with a notoriously difficult launch uh, that people had a lot of concerns and frustrations about. And they created a word cloud out of a bunch of feedback they received that helped them guide their own uh, development. Uh, at least I believe it was a word cloud. I know that they, they did a lot of uh, reviews, uh, um, analytics. And so yeah, like it's legal. Um, the only, if you're thinking about COPPA, which is uh, something that uh, Internet Safety for Children, that is 
uh, to my understanding, almost entirely about identification. Uh, and so long as you listen to the uh, takedown requests for like when someone, uh, the, like the right to be forgotten messages you get in your inbox, as long as you scrub that data, you're good. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm an lawyer, not a lawyer. If it's really concerning to you and you think you have a lot to lose, I mean, you probably have a lawyer which you can ask about. But I, I spent uh, a good deal of time researching COPPA specifically to make sure that analytics was in fact okay with that. And it really is just about like protecting them from like getting their information leaked or used against them, not um, generally improving a platform that's non-specific to them. Um, yeah, so good question. It's da I'm, I'm glad that people uh, keep in mind legality and ethics because, you know, who wants to support a developer without any of those? <laughs> uh, I swear. It's like, it's like you guys have a very unique opportunity to make an amazing game. And this is part of that. Um, don't, don't abuse it. I, there's a report abuse on, uh, button on Roblox for a reason. I'm using it on anyone who, who, does, who does this badly. And also, you could get in trouble. Like, please, uh, don't. At the very least, you could get canceled. <laughs> don't be weird. Be responsible. Decomposition tree, though, a lot, uh, lot less confusing. This one's actually some cool AI stuff. Um, you have the average duration. Uh, like, you basically tell it, hey, um, Based on all these different categories, uh, which by the way, it does have to be categories. This one does not. Uh, yeah, no, no, go for it. Well, actually, also, it's probably worth mentioning, it is legal in the US. By all means, if you are not in the US, check where the law is locally. There might even be some state level laws, because I know California is a little bit more protective than, uh, say, Indiana. But uh, yeah, I was unable to find anything that would make me think US stuff handles that differently. And yeah, I. And a, any, con, any country with internet is under some form of mass surveillance by that tool. Like Google literally exists to harvest data. You might have to, okay, actually, it, the, probably the worst case scenario is you'll have to check to see if a developer, to see if, uh, you have to let them opt out of it. And that's fine. I think opting out of data collection, um, I don't personally do it in my own games just because I know that I personally never go to the individual level, that I know that I personally am responsible. And I don't necessarily think that you have an ethical right to be forgotten. Like if you do something, people should be allowed to remember it. Um, so that's my own personal reason for not including a, a, a right to opt out stuff in the game. It's not mandatory either for in my region. Um, but like, uh, yeah, but like obviously I, I, I obey those requests I get uh, for that stuff, but in just in general, like the opt out of specific analytics prior to that, uh, prior to that formal takedown request, yeah, it's uh, it's tough because on the one hand, you don't, I mean, if you want to respect people's wishes, but on the other hand, like, what if the people, what if what if the what if the people who are having trouble in your game are the people who are pressing don't 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 an record analytics? Like in a sense, this is blindness. Uh, like maybe a compromise would be don't record stuff in private servers because that would skew stuff anyway. But like, even then, like, if you are being responsible as a developer, this tool should only really be for uh, improving the game and any bit of information you don't have that could have been important or influential. Well, that'll hurt you. And so yeah, no, I mean, I think we all have to come to terms with this in our own way. And if there's any regulation passed, obviously we will have to obey that. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting question. There's an entire world of uh, game development ethics that's probably a worthwhile debate or discussion. I think it should be a debate, though. Those are fun. Ugh. I want to debate someone. Other, other event organizers, let's have a debate. I'm going to fight someone. All those YouTubers are having debates. Yeah, we can, we can, we can bet Robux on it. I, actually, I don't know if we can. What, what, whatever the terms of service allow us to do. We can bet pride on it. Um, but yeah, no, so this is the decomposition tree. This one only works for labels. Uh, labels are these uh, very, um, so, so labels versus numbers. Label would be stuff like platform uh, or uh, the name of an event or, you know, just text. Uh, and you need to be text because this one literally will split stuff by text. Uh, if you, if you, you want to figure out why, whether certain numbers or metrics are influencing something, 
Uh, there's a separate tool for that. We'll show that in just a second. But for this, this is just for all about categories and labels. And uh, what it does is you find, you give them a metric to solve for, such as the increasing the average duration, and then literally just pl plug in plug in some uh, some platforms. Plug in pl sorry, plug in some categories. In fact, plug in as many as you want. You can put in as many in that explain by area, and then just have it show like the top two or three um, most influential. It is ins like, and, that, and that's the thing. Like you can see even right there, um, the average of duration. Um, like some of the, uh, I don't think I have it surveyed by. Uh, I don't think I have it sorted by. Uh, what's it called? Um, I don't believe I have it sorted by most influential right now. But uh, you can tell like people who use uh, a mouse were doing better than people who use in touch. Uh, people who were who purchased who who uh, purchased a boss. Um, like like a, a higher chance to become the, the the colossus in the next round, they they played a lot longer, and those who were selected as boss were right behind them, um, and people who chatted were behind that because you know talking in a game will increase like retention and play duration and all that stuff. But yeah, no, you can solve any KPI with this. You can solve it for any category. And you know what the best part is? Because this is Power BI and it's amazing, you can select, you can click any of those boxes, any of those little tabs. Like you can click. It says like, okay, yeah, I want to see what the game is like with just people who are selected as the boss and on the mouse. Basically, that 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 uh, Venn diagram stuff from earlier. This is that, and you can just select it, and it will automatically apply that filter onto every every single visual on the entire page, and you can immediately see, okay, this is what is causing people to do this. It's amazing. It is amazing. And yeah, I. I if you don't see the value in that, I can't help you. Like it's to to be able to so rapidly switch between different filters is that is that is amazing. And yeah, so from there we move on to uh, the pretty much final visualization we're going to be talking about tonight: uh, key influencers, which is a little panel that pops up that's all about numbers. Uh, if before you had to set in categories, this one you are comparing numbers to numbers, where I believe it does a basic correlative analysis, where basically it correlates everything against everything, and then tries to rule out what uh, what influences are caused by each other, and what is actually directly causing stuff. And uh, from there, uh, which I believe is just the square root of the correlation, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah, no, yeah, no, this is, uh, yeah, Power BI, use it. It's a great, it's great. Yeah, the, um, but yeah, so the FPS example, for example here, when the FPS is above 17, the average session duration increases by two minutes. Yeah, that's stuff that I could have put up, I could have maybe tried to squint it at a scatter plot or uh, done my own correlations. All I had to do was just plug in a bunch of num numeric metrics. Just plug in a bunch of metrics. You can plug in as many as you want. There's no limit. Plug in all of your number metrics. And it will look through all of them and find the ones that actually seem to have an influence. It's amazing. And you can even expand it across different... Uh, set that you, can, like, uh, you can have it show uh, it across different categories as well uh, in the expand by, in expand by area. Uh, but yeah, no, like these, these are great. These are great. Um, if I, I guess if I had one criticism for the key influencer panel, it's that uh, when you're using it for KPIs, there aren't always, it's not always sensitive enough to show you the exact um, influence of every single one of them because it's so cautious. It doesn't want to give you a bad idea. And because, like, you notice the smallest one there, the smallest influence there is 1.68 minutes. There are most certainly ways that these things impact session duration that are more than 1.68 minutes in, like, magnitude. Like, they're, like, are more fine-tuned than that. Like, it could be, like, a five-second boost. But, like, it doesn't want to tell you that. So, yeah, you might have run a correlation to be extra safe for smaller stuff, but in general, just for getting a good idea of what matters right now, 
check that. And you can you can have it solve for increasing the session duration and decreasing it, which can be equally important. Because don't think of your game as uh, like getting players to stay in your game for longer. Getting focus on uh, not getting them to exit as quickly. Because like, at the end of the day, all your players will exit. That's inevitable. The question is when. And what causes that? Yeah, so this is your game. This is my own Power, uh, Power BI panel that shows a good overview of everything I could want for uh, uh, Colossus Valley, a game I made in a week. I set this up. I set up this in about, uh, I believe, six hours. Um, maybe eight hours. And honestly, like, six of those hours was just messing around with these visuals, trying out new things. Most of, every, most of the stuff was set up to what it needed to be after two. And yeah, that's, that's Power BI. And I guess that brings us to part four, the Midas method. Midas, mark it with a pretentious sounding acronym. I, implement the presentation as you all witnessed. D, delay discussing acronym until end. A, admit it's really just a marketing gag. S. Sorry for fooling you. It's hard to make analytics sound interesting. Ah. Sorry about that. Not really. Not. But yeah. Hopefully this had enough value in it to make up for that uh, trickery. Um, but yeah, what did we learn today? The meta model. Why games succeed. How to design your, layer, your uh, game with layers of goals to keep them compelling. The foundation of analytics. A pretty standard and reliable workflow for hooking up analytics yourself. How to make a dashboard in Power BI uh, with, and, and all the crazy stuff you can do with it. And I guess that brings us to the reality that your game's success is in your hands. Guide them with analytics. And yeah, I think, uh, thank you for watching. Be awkward if nobody had showed up. Yeah, Q&A time. Uh, there aren't too many people here, so we'll probably keep this short. But if you guys have any questions, uh, now's the perfect time. <sighs> How do you do that? I'm going to, while you type out your questions, I'm going to pour some Sprite. your health. Yeah. Okay. This presentation brought to you by Sprite. They haven't paid me any money, but I do drink it a lot. Probably too much. I don't feel healthier when I drink diet soda. Feel like I've been fooled. Yeah, but no, it's uh, yeah. Thank you all for showing up. I uh, hope you guys got some useful, um, useful information. Yeah, I guess I'll I'll stick around for the next five minutes if anyone has any questions. But uh, yeah, I mean that's it. That's uh, that's games. No problem. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is everything I've learned. I, uh, yeah, no, I guess it's, a lot of it had to be iterated upon personally because, like, a lot of, like, some of this stuff is pretty widespread and accessible through uh, some of the books behind me. But, uh, yeah, it's like this one right here. Uh, where can, can you, we buy you a coffee? Oh, uh, no. Um, well, I have a Patreon if you're interested in that. I occasionally, I don't talk about uh, design stuff as much. Uh, but no, uh, Patreon is appreciated. Also, I mean, here's the thing, guys. I, uh, I am available for hire for contracting if this all just seemed too laborious. So, uh, you, we can work out specific rates. I, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's, this isn't meant to be an advertisement for me, but, I mean, I do have experience in it, as you can tell. But yeah, no, it's, uh, 
Yeah, but no, this this a lot of the stuff you discover a lot of it on on your own just reading other design manuals. But I'd say this especially this took a lot of uh, this was my own creation. I had to do a lot of uh, iteration and practicing for that. Um, and yeah. Anyway, yeah. So uh, what? Yeah. So um, what metrics? would you say is the most important for someone who is very new to game analytics? What is necessarily, okay, ne necessity, that is all about KPI. So the first thing you should study, if anything, study your KPIs. Find the retention rate, the monetization, all that stuff. Plug it into that one campaign uh, simulation tool I provided earlier, um, which I'll be linking below in, in the recorded version of this. Um, Plug all those metrics in to see if your game would succeed enough on your own. And check to make sure that your retention rate is above the uh, necessary level of, um, let's see, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make this not full screen anymore. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so, like uh, this stuff before with like the retention rates, you remember how those, how like the, the retention rates really just take off at some point? Yeah. Get your retention rate to a, your day one retention rate to above 11 percent or 12 percent, and your day seven retention rate, um, ideally around. Uh, I mean, the thing is, if you're most of the games that fail fail because the D one's bad. D seven should still be watched to make stuff better, um, but D uh, D one most of these games aren't like your next big. Uh, pastime for most players. They'll play it every once in a while. Uh, yeah, and so check your retention, check, plug in your metrics into this sheet right here, and it'll tell you how well your game is going to do. And then mess around with those metrics or propose different changes to them, like what if I increase the session duration by 10%? What if I increase the blah, blah, blah? You know, like figure, like troubleshoot, you can even optimize, like you can eat, there's a thing in Excel called Solver. If you download this and run it in Excel, you can actually literally have it auto, like automate the process of getting you the best campaign duration, best spending habits, best metrics for various things. Like, uh, but that's more advanced usage. Uh, the so yeah, just KPIs. That is your golden ticket. Um, just plug in stuff to this form. Try to get your your day one retention above ten percent. And if I had to guess the reasons that your game would be failing that? Your, the reason that your game would be failing in any of these KPIs is because of this stuff right here. It's because either they don't have enough interesting goals long-term to, to, to stay engaged, or they're getting stuck at some point in one of the goal cycles. So track for that, see if you can figure out what that is, start small. You don't need to track every event. Start by tracking the most important one and branch out from there if you aren't comfortable with stuff yet. And also, um, if possible, like really double check your analytics before putting up an ad. Because I've had times where I put up an ad only to realize that it wasn't recording a key piece of data. The worst was when I forgot to record the session ID and it couldn't connect like different player events together. It was rough. Um, but yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's analytics. Analytics and the uh, Roblox economy and all that stuff. <laughs> the Midas method. It's silly because at first I, I, I was sitting around trying to think about marketing ways to make this sound more interesting than it was as a three hour, 40 minute uh, discussion on analytics I think I, I think I'll chop this up to like maybe make it episodic um, but yeah the what's it called um yeah no the the, the Midas method that really was just because I uh, I want I, I went for something like ah yes my every game now I'll never have to fail again because I'll always be able to track where my game's going wrong and I know the reasons why so I can always fix it. And AKA it'll always become successful, always become like golden in that sense. And from there I was like, ah, oh, what if I called it the Midas method? Except the thing is, there's no 
Midas method here. There's no, like, I never used that. I got to the solution I needed without needing any silly acronyms like that. Um, yeah, so I just sat down for like 10 minutes trying to think, oh, well, how could I sort of summarize all this into the Midas, into the M-I-D-A-S? And I said, it'd be, it'd be funnier if I just didn't. I mean, because like if I tried it and it looked stupid, it would that wouldn't make things better. It wouldn't give them anything. Yeah. Yeah. The. Uh, oh yeah. No. No. Definitely. Uh, KPIs are very important. But yeah, checking them is important. Um, make sure that. Also, if you haven't been, track as much about the player state as you can as you feel comfortable with at least. Because the, the, I'd say the most influential, I probably should mention this earlier, but one of the most influential things that you'll find as a uh, KPI influencer, specifically, uh, I'd say like play duration, retention, I don't think it's everything, is server fill. Like that, the whole player density stuff, that influences uh, a few areas, not just through messaging rate, um, but obviously messaging rate helps a lot. I guess messaging is sort of standing for social interactions, but uh, the the point is, if you advertise your game one day, and it gets the server is half full, and then you advertise your game another day, and the server is completely full, and you see a huge change in your KPIs, that's because of the difference in the server most of the time, because servers can sway things by like a factor of twenty per twenty or thirty, maybe even forty percent for some of the really social games. And yeah, you need to make sure to correct for that. And so if you're going to be iterating on your design uh, through a, across multiple updates, you want to have as much of that state stuff tracked as possible so you can watch as stuff changes. So you can make sure that you're recognizing how things will be different between certain days. How, like, uh, for example, you might find that uh, on the weekends, your game gets played for longer. Like, if your second test just happens to be on the weekend, well, that, that'll, it'll, it might give you the wrong idea. And, like, that's probably the most dangerous part about analytics. It's finding all the hidden ways that your data is getting skewed. And, thankfully, with correlations, you can pretty much pin down certain parts of it as being explicitly due to that factor, but they're never going to give you a correlation of one-to-one. -one. Like there's always going to be some, some hidden room. And typically, that hidden area, that, that, that hidden influence, is more than enough to, think that, to make you think that you've changed something uh, when you really haven't, and it's just the margin of error. So yeah, uh, be careful. Yeah, in fact, you might even consider like limiting your audience explicitly down to like a very small subset for all your general analytics. Like for one project I did, I only considered analytics for uh, users uh, from uh, starting, like, from for users, uh, what's it called, in server, who played during when the server was above, filled, filled above half. Um, and yeah, also, I, I think this is probably more, this is something I prefer to do, but I guess people m might uh, have different opinions on it. Um, when tracking your players, only track new players. Like, by all means, track those new players when they return, but don't, like, don't, like, track players who uh, are coming back, uh, who, who, who have pray, played your game from a time when you were blind from an analytics perspective. Because, realistically, they're, they're like, they're, their data is dirty. They have a different experience because of that untracked historical data. Uh, yeah, so start off a fresh slate every time. See, I think I am getting kind of hungry though, so I think we'll wrap it up. Um, if you 
want to ask me questions about analytics or uh, offer me a job, uh, the dev forum is open. And I respond to stuff there. Also, if you have access to my Discord, by all means, message me there. I think people, uh, you can send me a request if you share a server with me, um, which most of you probably will, but uh, my username there is uh, CJ underscore Boyer, uh, and then uh, one, like hashtag zero 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 one. Uh, yeah, and but I mean, dev form is probably easier. I don't always accept uh, friend requests if I don't recognize the person or the username. But yeah, uh, well, I will uh, talk to you later, and I'm very grateful that y'all stuck around. All right. Bye, everyone. I will catch you next time.